uh, Open Space Board of Trustees meeting. Uh, we are looking forward to a good meeting. And I, before we start, I, I just want to reminisce for a minute that 10 years ago, almost to the day, the Open Space Board met on the eve of the 2013 flood. Oh. And the weather when we went into that meeting was about like this. Um, and as the meeting progressed, we started getting dire announcements from the you know, city uh, emergency department on Boulder Creek and abandoning the building. But true to our commitment, we finished the meeting. But when we went out, Boulder Creek was unbelievable. It was really rocking and rolling. And it was like, whoa. So this, this, I, was, I was driving in here today, this uh, reminded me of, of that time, almost, almost to the, certainly the day. Um, anyway, hopefully it won't be that today. <laughs> um, so let me run through the agenda real quickly. Um, we do have a public comment set up. Uh, there'll be matters from the board. There's one uh, public hearing item. Uh, so under public comment, if people um, have, have comments or um, concerns, please uh, do those at public comment. The public hearing will be a consideration of a request to approve and recommend a permitted use a portion of the city's uh, get hard open space property uh, for uh, disposal to accommodate uh, a sewer line connection from uh, development. So uh, if you want to speak to that item, uh, there will be an opportunity uh, when we get there on the agenda. Otherwise, uh, public comment is time to, to speak to the board. And then we'll finish with matters from the department. So I'll do a roll call of the board. Um, Brady? Here. John? Hello. Michelle? Here. And I'm Dave, and I'm here as well. And uh, Caroline uh, will not be here. She's experiencing some difficulties getting here via airlines. So uh, she won't be with us this evening. Um, so we'll go to approval of the minutes, but before we do that, in the excitement of uh, the last meeting in April, I, I neglected to entertain a motion and a second to approve the minutes. <laughs> and so I was reminded that I, I need to do that uh, so the record can reflect that uh, that was done. So if uh, I could have- Because you recused yourself. I remember yourself. being told I can't vote for it. Right. It was a unanimous, and so I just, you know, kind of just right over the fact that we can do the motion in a second. So if someone would make a motion to accept the minutes of the April 8th board meeting in a second, uh, that would be great. I'll All second. Great. So Michelle moved, uh, John seconded. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. <laughs> so I think we're good. Because I, we're present, we have to do roll calls because we're all present. Is that right? Oh, for the, for the well, um, uh, for, for the, the minutes. Yeah. To, we can do a roll call. I mean, we can all just say hi, that was unanimous, or because I think before we had to do that many, yeah, okay. affirmative. Great. John, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yes. Michelle? Yes. And I vote yes, so we're good. Thanks for keeping me on track. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, Sam, if you want to go over, well, no, uh, let's do the minutes uh, first. So, um, so the minutes of the April meeting, if anyone has comments on page one. I had, a, I had two brief ones. Um, I think we ought to put who, uh, made the motions to appoint. So uh, John uh, moved to uh, appoint Michelle as vice chair, and I moved to appoint Leah 
Um, and we'd have Brady appointing, uh, moving to appoint me. So I think if we could uh, just put who made the motions, uh, I think that would be good. Are those um, nominations? The motion to, yeah, to uh, nominate, All right. Okay, uh, page two. Okay, page three. Seeing none, I will entertain a motion uh, and a second to approve the minutes. Motion to approve the minutes from the April 12, 2023 meeting as amended. Thank you. Please I'll second that. Thank you. Um, we'll do a roll call, John. <laughs> yes. Michelle? Yes. Brady? And I vote yes, so it's unanimous. Great. Uh, so Sam, if you would like to go through the procedures for public comment, that would be great. Yes. yes. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Just going to share my screen here. Okay, one more time. Okay. The city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and board commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences and political perspectives. For more information about this vision and the community engagement processes, please visit this site that's listed here. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up to speak using the name they are commonly known by, and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently, only audio testimony is permitted online. So it doesn't look like we have anyone uh, joining by phone. If you are joining by phone, um, I'll have some instructions for you when we get to the public comment portion. Um, mm -hmm. We do have one person signed up to speak for public comment so far. If you would like to speak for public comment and you have not signed up yet, um, you can raise your hand by either clicking the raise hand function on the bottom of your screen. If you don't see that on the bottom of your screen, you can click on the little icon that says participants and then the three dots in the bottom right hand corner and you'll see an option to raise your hand there. And that should be it. Great, thank you. And I think uh, given that we don't have a, a whole lot of uh, people signed up, we'll do three minutes. Um, so who do we have first? So we have uh, Mark Rosenberg signed up for general public comment. Okay. Mark, if you're there, um, please join us. And I do see, I see a Mark here who I believe is Mark Rosenberg. Uh, a bit of feedback I heard from the last meeting. Um, I don't know, do, do our speakers see the timer on their screen? They will now. Um, we, the last meeting, we're using a different application this time. So if you um, do not see that, please put that in the chat or in the Q&A and I can, we can address that. Hopefully you can see the timer that's gonna be popping up now. The feedback I received was that if, as a speaker, it feels better to see the people you're addressing mm. as opposed to just this countdown timer, which in this particular speaker provoked a fair amount of anxiety. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so not only are you not speaking to anybody, you're just speaking to the amount of time you have. Okay. And so I don't know if there's, I just wanted to pass that on. That maybe this isn't the best time. All right, well, can, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, Mark, we can hear you. Okay, I, I don't have any timer here, but uh, I don't think we'll need it. Um, uh, you, 
You don't, do you see a timer? Uh, it's a white box. Do you see that on your end? Hopefully that's. No, uh, and, and the chat box is disabled. So okay. <clears throat> I'll take what I can get. <laughs> well, we can hear you, so uh, go ahead. All right, good. I, I'm, I'm concerned that the uh, Open Spaces Board of Trustees is uh, not meeting its obligations as the steward of the Sombrero Marsh. Uh, there are two issues that require your immediate attention. The first is that the water level in the marsh has been low for the past six months, even during periods of ample precipitation. Uh, OSMP authority has water available through an irrigation ditch to which it has rights, but apparently did not draw as much water last year as usual. Uh, there are two ponds at Sombrero Marsh. The larger eastern one has been dry in recent months, often nothing more than a salt pan. Normally, we see hundreds of migratory waterfowl and raptors at the marsh each spring. This year, there have been almost none. Uh, community residents have contacted OSNP staff. In reply, we've been told that your staff is aware of the problem and is thinking about what could be done possibly months from now. And this sounds a lot like politicians who tell mass shooting victims that they are in their thoughts and prayers. The response is not satisfactory. The irrigation ditch that runs through our community and potentially serves some Brera Marsh has water in it now. The marsh needs some of it. The second issue that I believe you need to address is that uh, OSBT has been mostly silent about the modular home factory that Boulder Valley School District plans to put on its property at 6500 Arapahoe. This site overlooks Sombrero Marsh. The factory's pending construction on its operation are direct threats to the marsh ecosystem. As federal money is involved, an environmental assessment is required. The initial EA was so riddled with factual and procedural errors that it was withdrawn. The new EA was issued recently and currently is open for public comment. While the more egregious factual errors have been addressed in the revised environmental assessment, there still are several serious errors of omission which should be of concern to the OSBT. Like the original, the new EA carefully omits any reference to Sombrero Marsh, even though it is just a few hundred yards downhill from the proposed factory site. The, the dedicated open space that is the buffer between the BVSD property and the marsh is referred to as vacant land. The revised EA again fails to discuss any alternative locations for the factory, perhaps because this is because no others were considered. Still missing from the revised EA is any meaningful discussion of factory-related transportation issues. Uh, the BBSD is insisting that heavy truck traffic run along 63rd Street, which runs directly adjacent to portions of the marsh. Uh, so uh, the record is open for comment on the revised but still farcical EA for the BBSD school project. I urge the board to speak up for Sombrero Marsh to assure that it gets the consideration that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate your comments. Uh, Dan, do you have any staff update on the situation uh, re related to the factory uh, at Sombrero Marsh? Uh, not in relationship to the factory. I can speak to the water rights issue a little bit. In okay. fact, um, we were planning to uh, put together a written memo for, for this board for next month to describe the, uh, the environment, uh, the situation, the water rights, uh, the historic nature of, of water in the marsh, water not in the marsh, and how there is a cyclical nation, uh, 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 <clears throat> system to, to that area. Uh, the short answer is, is there is actually <clears throat> not water rights that we own or could use to actually fill the marsh. We do have adjacent lands that are uh, not uh, that not of the marsh itself that we could uh, we have water rights to do flood irrigation. Uh, uh, there there probably have been years most recently where there's been free water, meaning that uh, there's a time uh, around this time when uh, the water commissioner deems that there's free water available and you could make calls on your water rights earlier in earlier in the year than your rights normally would be. And we have called early water through the uh, free water um, program. And that uh, in some years probably tailings from the irrigation that occurs on adjacent lands makes it way into the marsh. And so there could be years where water 
uh, Benders the Marsh earlier. Uh, right now, uh, free water is, is not available to us. And so we're subject to the water rights that we have on our adjacent lands. And uh, when we begin to flood irrigate those lands, uh, there is some effect with tail, tail water leaving those lands that do enter the marsh. Uh, but we do not have water rights directly available for us to call the, with the purpose of filling the marsh. It's not the purpose of the water rights that the city owns there. Okay. Um, so, but we will provide a written memo to describe not only that, but the fact that this is a wetland ecosystem that is meant to sort of dry and become replenished with water and, and there is species and, and water uh, habitat quality that depend on that fluctuation of water and even times with no water in that system. Great. Well, we'll look forward to the update um, at the next meeting. And uh, also, on the, as far as the factory situation is concerned, the board um, did uh, you know, consider uh, the staff's proposal and made some recommendations. Um, I think the, the actual um, you know, official consideration is at the council level, and um, they've uh, addressed that as as well. So, um, if there are some issues uh, from the staff perspective that the board needs to be aware of or or uh, further consider, um, I ask, and I'm sure that uh, you'll bring those to our attention. Yeah, I guess I could provide you a little bit of update. Council's uh, and council's motion and decision making over that, they did ask about uh, ways that we could, that the department could monitor uh, the health of the marsh ecosystem out there and, and, and encourage us to develop sort of a monitoring system or protocol or process that could help us develop uh, information over time about how the marsh is doing from an ecological standpoint. And so staff uh, uh, has met a couple of times uh, since that council meeting to first determine to do an inventory of what do we currently monitor out there? What historical monitoring have we done? And then to uh, uh, fill in the gaps with additional monitoring that we, we may want to do so we could, um, you know, throughout time be able to provide some reports to council boards community about the health of the marsh, quote unquote, that we might be able to ascertain from monitoring that the department does. So we have followed up on council's uh, motion on that and uh, have begun to look at that monitoring question. Could you uh, include that information in the update as far as kind of where staff is at sure. on, on, uh, on the monitoring situation and what, what uh, you'll be looking at or address, addressing uh, as part of that. I think that would be helpful if, if that would be part of the update. We'll do. Great, thanks. Uh, anyone else, Sam? Um, we don't have anyone else with their hands up. We do have one person who is joined uh, by phone. So if you'd like to raise your hand to speak for public comment for items not identified for public hearing, you can press star nine. I'm not seeing any other hands. Great. Well, then we'll uh, close public comment and go to matters from the board. Um, under this item, uh, this is an opportunity for us to uh, raise questions or comments on any of the written information memos um, or public comment that we have received. And the written information uh, was basically uh, a summary of the preferred alternative approach for reducing prairie dog uh, related conflicts to OSMP irrigated agricultural lands, an update on the community wildfire protection plan, and the 2022 master plan annual report. So, if anyone would like to address comments or questions, concerns, now is a good time. Um, not about any particular item, um, but I just wanted to say that I appreciated the um, summary of the prairie dog, the preferred alternative approach to the prairie dog um, um, plan. Um, and I learned a lot from reading that. I, I wasn't here in 2019, mm -hmm. 2020, and I thought, found it to be very informative and in giving all that background. And so I feel like I'm prepared for our field trip somewhat more next week. 
Yeah, great. And, uh, and and one of the objectives of the field trip is to, con is to continue to provide that background information. So when June comes along and we're and we're actually around this table discussing it, uh, hopefully you'll feel more informed and ready to participate in that regards. But yeah, we realized that most of you were not here. And so we wanted to take some time at this memo to kind of set that back background stage and provide that type of information. So thank you. I liked how you were in intense community involvement. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the that's understatement of the <laughs> Uh, Dan, do you want to, is this a time, a good time to uh, just uh, remind us and the public of the field trip? Yeah, so uh, on uh, May 18th, uh, we'll be departing, meeting here and departing here at three o'clock at the hub. And uh, we'll take you to a, f a few uh, irrigated agricultural properties that the department uh, manages. And uh, through those visits, we will uh, continue to better understand some of the issues that we'll be discussing in June. Um, so I think we have two or three stops that are on our itinerary. Uh, we're uh, trying to design it in a way where we're not spending a lot of time traveling between sites so we could squeeze it all in uh, between three and five. But yeah, we'll be meeting here at the hub uh, on May 18th at three. Great, hopefully that's on everyone's calendar and we're looking uh, forward to that. Uh, anything else, um, Michelle, did you want to? Yeah, um, I want to bring up um, the issue of attendance from OSBT members. Um, you know, we are on May 10th and, um, you know, Brady just got appointed last month. I did mention last month how honored I am to serve on this board. Um, I take my service to the community seriously and, um, I believe it's important that as appointed trustees, we actively participate in the, biz the, the monthly business meetings, the um, special meetings and other events that the department has. I'm concerned that one of our trustees, Caroline Miller, um, has now missed or hasn't participated in four meetings so far in the last six months, including tonight. And I understand that life happens, travel situations happen, internet can be funky even in the greater United States. Um, but I do think that um, at a certain point, we need to acknowledge when an appointment to, is being squandered. We are here to serve the community and I don't think that the, the community is being served. Um, and I, I think we just need to acknowledge that um, the lack of participation, the lack of attendance is a failure, is failing our community. I don't know what we can um, do about that tonight. I think that um, I, I wanted to just highlight that and, the, and say that on the public record. I think when we do our, our retreat this fall, we ought to revisit attendance in our, our, our rules and procedures. Um, I don't know that that's governed on by, by us as a board, um, but I'd like to have some understanding of, of, of what expected. I think it's, a, it's given that we are gonna attend these our, our meetings. We're gonna do our best to, to participate fully in our meetings, um, whether over Zoom, by phone, or in, in person. Um, and uh, I certainly expected that, I, you know, uh, you know, vacations happen and people get sick. That's, you know, that, that's life. But, but there, when there's a pattern, um, and especially in the six month period, there's been four meetings that um, Caroline has missed. We, we just need to acknowledge that. And I think that, uh, yeah, that's something ought, ought to be done by it, about it. We are failing our community. Yeah, I think uh, attendance is extremely important. Um, and uh, what I'm going to suggest is that I will follow up uh, with each board member and make sure that if there are some things, issues or concerns that uh, might interfere or impact your abilities to uh, participate um, in board meetings, um, you know, child care, you know, is, is certainly one of them as well. And we've talked about that. Um, and I will talk uh, specifically with Caroline as well. Um, in the meantime, and so I will uh, 
come back to the board uh, at some point soon um, and just raise, you know, if there are any concerns that we need to uh, acknowledge and see if we can't figure out how, to, how best to uh, work around those. So. Dave, uh, is, is there not a, a pretty explicit attendance requirement? Yes. There is. Is, is, is the, the organizing language for the OSBT clear on what happens? If, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. um, three unexcused uh, absences uh, will um, require the board to address. Uh, and in fact, uh, our grounds for removal of uh, the board member if that's the board's desire. Dave, the only nuance of that, and I don't have it in front of me, but it may be three consecutive. Yeah. Oh, right. But yes, it, right. I don't know if it's just three meetings in general no, or if it's, it's consecutive. three consecutive yeah. meetings. Yeah, you're right. Just right. So we'll, uh, I think, you know, having the full board, the COVID has, uh, you know, kind of interfered uh, the last couple of years with just the overall, you know, kind of uh, working of, of boards and, and uh, groups. But I, I do think that as we are now kind of hoping, hoping to get back to some sense of normalcy that um, we should have ex expectations that, that people will be uh, participating and attending. Uh, the board meetings. So I will come back uh, with anything I learn um, at the June meeting that we can address uh, as a board. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I, I just wanted to say, but, and we do have one more um, official item that we need to get to under matters, but uh, <clears throat> and in that regard, as far as uh, uh, board organization, I, I would like to ask board members that to when they would like to make a comment or ask a question or whatever to raise, raise their hand so that I can, as we do at council, I can kind of keep the, the conversation uh, somewhat organized. And I, I'm asking you, Michelle, to help me do that. Uh, and I know sometimes uh, either I'm not looking at the screen or the screen is hard to see if uh, board members are attending virtually. And, I think, John, uh, you experienced that at the last meeting. Um, and Brady helped me uh, know that you were um, you know, wanting to say something. So um, if we can agree that uh, we'll kind of raise our hand or give me an indication that you'd like to, uh, to say something, what I'll do is try and keep it organized so that we can uh, have a coherent conversation. So I appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I did want to men mention one statewide issue that's happening right now that might be of interest to the board and department. There's, um, I think most of us are aware there's something called uh, recreational use statutes. Every state in the union has them. They provide uh, some degree of liability protection for landowners of both private and public lands in some instances and, um, who open their property for recreation without charging. Anything. There, uh, the Colorado Recreational Use Statute has been serving us quite well as a state for a long time. There was recently a, a high profile lawsuit with a $7.3 million uh, award. An unfortunate accident that happened um, at the Colorado Springs Air Force Academy, which has had a chilling effect on some private landowners. Uh, interest and willingness to keep their land open for public use. You can imagine if you're a landowner uh, and you're getting literally nothing from no, no uh, money from opening your land to uh, public recreation, you'd want to be, you'd want to know reasonably certainly that you're not going to lose everything because of a lawsuit. <clears throat> well, two of our 14ers, Lincoln and Democrat, have subsequently. Uh, <clears throat> closed as a function of this. And um, there's a coalition uh, growing and building. There was a bill to address this that failed uh, in committee on party lines. The Trial Attorneys Association and the Democrats were against it. Uh, and there is now a coalition uh, building to try to take another run at this. Um, and interestingly enough, Teller County and Park County are part of that coalition, the Nature Conservancy, uh, Keep It Colorado, um, and Boulder Climbing Community, a little nonprofit here in Boulder, is leading a lot of the charge behind the scenes. So I just want to bring this to people's attention. I, Dan, I talked to you about it, and you uh, responded, and Dave, and you responded, well, Brady, this is how, you know, the, the process whereby the city may or may not actually officially weigh in on this. 
as a private citizen, I just want you all to know that I'm working on it, being very clear, I'm not speaking for OSBT or OSMP. Uh, that being said, the various iterations of the bill, we don't have a bill yet, but various iterations could continue the, the protections for, for public entities or even increase those protections. And I won't get into all the details, but if anybody wants to know more, I'd be happy to share that with you. And I would encourage uh, the city to, to consider the implications of this potential bill on our land holdings and access. Great, thank you again. Um, I know you're following up on that. Do you, uh, do you wanna just weigh in on kind of- Well, I got a question for Brady, just on the timing. When do you expect a, a new bur uh, bill to it'll emerge? It'll be a while. It'll be, it'll be, a, it'll be a while. It's the, they're in recess. They're in recess. Now. And yeah. I think the coalition is trying to take a look at what's politically most expedient and strategy. Um, again, I have to get into too many details, but uh, the, the, the greater coalition was caught somewhat flat-footed. And I think there's mm -hmm. going to be an attempt to make a much more sophisticated uh, approach yeah. this time. So I will, um, as soon as I have any indication of what, when there might be a bell, I can mention. That'd be great. In the meantime, I'm uh, actually meeting tomorrow with our chief, uh, the city's chief policy advisor, who is the interface between staff and council in terms of developing policy statements and policy positions that the city takes. I wanna learn more about how that all works uh, and uh, as well as uh, getting any feedback from, from the city's perspective of did, did did we know about that previous bill? What was what was concerns, if any, from us? So I'm sort of on a little bit of a learning curve here. So, um, but uh, I'm taking those steps to learn more about the city's process for establishing positions. Thank you. Yeah, and you you could let the board know what you find out uh, either by email or, sure. or maybe yeah. uh, under matters from the department at the June meeting. That'd be great. Um, I had a quick question before we get to the final item. Um, and I'm not sure anyone here uh, can answer it, but do we know who the consultant is that is um, doing the update of the uh, wildfire plan? I believe, I don't know if it's officially signed yet, but uh, uh, there was, there is a, uh, a firm that uh, uh, put in a successful application. And I think we were just the city was ironing out the details, but it, it may actually be executed at this point. Uh, if Carrie Webster is listening in, maybe she could email me <laughs> or uh, uh, give me a chat on uh, uh, if, if that's completed. That'd be great. So the last item uh, under matters is um, our uh, official comments to the city council at, the June, at its June 1st meeting on uh, the actions that the board took to make recommendations on e-bikes. And what I uh, have proposed is that uh, we, we have a minority opinion report and a majority opinion report. Um, and Michelle has graciously offered to do the majority <laughs> opinion and I will do the majority opinion and also um, just make a few brief introductory comments to the council just saying here's kind of how we're gonna handle the you know, our part of uh, the presentation or the comments. So if there aren't any objections to that process or other suggestions, um, I, I think we'll await, Dan's gonna check with the, uh, with the city council uh, advisory committee and see if that's appropriate in their minds or what they would like. And if that's the case, then that's what we'll plan on doing this. Uh, so th a three minute comment. So it'd be a total of eight, eight minutes or so of our, our comments uh, to the council on June 1st. Are there any other questions or suggestions or does that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds good to me. I don't know if you can find out, Dan, whether we will actually be part of the agenda or we, uh, are we spending time out of the public input? Public yeah, hearing? I've seen it done in several different ways and I'll seek to get some clarity at CAC meetings, uh, which I'll prep in the next couple of weeks. So before the meeting, we'll for sure know. Um, I've seen it done uh, after staff presentation, after public uh, board 
uh, actually public hearing, then board goes into deliberations. One of the first things, how I've seen it as the last for the boards. Uh, about, uh, I could also see maybe CAC would like it to be part of the staff presentation and then go to the board. Uh, so I'll, I'll get a feel for what how CAC wants to handle that. Great. Yeah. You good? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I think that concludes uh, matters from the board. Um, our next item is the public hearing on the consideration of a request to approve and recommend the permitted use of a portion of the city of Boulder's Gebhardt open space property by the city of Boulder Public Works uh, dash utilities department in compliance with the disposal procedures of article 12, section 177 of the city of Boulder charter to install, operate and maintain a sanitary sewer connection. So, Dan, I think great. Well, I'm uh, going to turn this right over to uh, uh, Bethany Collins, who is our senior manager of our real estate uh, uh, services group here at OSMP, and uh, the real estate wing of uh, program area of the department is the area that tends to receive disposal requests and then works them through, collects the information that's needed, assembles that information to the board. And so typically that's our real estate group that does that. And then they work across the department in order to get feedback and that sort of thing. So that over the last two or three months, that's what Bethany has been leading on is this is typically the requests come into the department and then Bethany will help uh, uh, lead in putting all the information together. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Bethany. I think you're you muted, uh, Bethany. No. No. Uh, you're, I think you're still muted. <laughs> hmm. Doesn't say muted on her end, does it? No, we'll see what that's like. Yeah, but let's see. Well, while we're waiting, uh, there's one thing I forgot to say under matters from the board, and that is thank you to staff for the uh, written memos. Um, uh, on the agenda the, and the wildfire protection plan and the prairie dog uh, memo as well. I, I think they were very helpful and uh, certainly instructive. And so uh, thanks again for those. Thank you. Oh, she looks like she's got the mute sign on her end, but <clears throat> no, it's down. Just like a... I've never known you to be this quiet for this <laughs> long, Bethany. <laughs> <laughs> We heard the public. That's true. We yeah. did hear that speaker. Just keep talking, Bethany, <laughs> while we try different things. Bethany, worst case, if you if it's not working, if you want to hop off, we can put you back on as a panelist. Work or call it, yeah. I can advance your slides for you too if you chat them to me. If you want to call in? Seems like we heard me. I don't think it was a mic issue because we heard Mark loud and clear. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's always something. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to your time we're back. And Sam is your thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mine, mine is muted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other Zoom setting or something. I wonder if she has her headphones, if her device may be set to her headphones, mm -hmm. or yeah. sometimes that's a thing to look at too. She had a lunch too. Yeah. yeah. Well, John, you're our IT. Hey, I could uh, provide some director updates that I was probably going to do later tonight. That'd be fine. Let's do that. <laughs> and uh, as soon as we get Bethany, then we'll 
Okay. Uh, just a, a little bit of good news. Uh, some of you may know that we had a uh, bridge closure going over Boulder Creek out by right White Rocks on the East Boulder Trail. Uh, we needed to uh, put a new base on that bridge. And so for a number of weeks, it was either off limits or limited and just want to report that that bridge is back up and running and that connection is ready to go and I think has been ready to go now for a couple of weeks. But uh, just wanted to report some good news on some infrastructure work there. Um, uh, also just want to mention that uh, last night we had this room packed with junior rangers. Uh, and so we have completed the hiring of about 111, 112 junior rangers uh, this year, but that sort of signifies that field season is well underway. I think our trails crew joins us at the end of uh, beginning of next week. Uh, we've already been out there with our assistant crew leads and our crew leads. Uh, uh, trail crew members are joining us, the FIMP crews out there ready to go. So all of our temporary and seasonal staff are, are uh, mostly in place and out on our system and uh, through training and all that. So super excited about uh, about that work uh, that is underway. Uh, so yeah, just uh, a couple of little tidbits there. Great. How many people Great. applied? You have 111? Yay! Yay. <laughs> yes. Um, I think we had about 160 that applied and about 112 open. So uh, That's more than usual, right? Applicants? I think we had about 15, maybe 15 to 20 more last year. But this number that we have, depending on the year, it's it's within the range of what we see, but a little bit down from last year. Which is more or less true across all of our postings. I get those young kids to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bethany, I think we're ready for you. All right, and can you see my presentation in kind of a normal form or what's it looking like right now? Okay. No presentation. Yeah. Okay. We're looking at you. <laughs> All right, let's try one more time. See? Uh, oh, hang on. Janelle chimed in 174 applicants. Oh, 174 applicants. Okay, okay so that is it's uh, pretty more normal. Typical issue. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> We're having years where there are like 200 applicants, yeah. right? Okay, that's my thought. Then you hired about 50%. Yeah. And then just in terms of like recruitment strategy, I think we've branched out quite a bit in hiring Spanish-speaking crews and bilingual looking crews. looking at your or meeting agenda, not your PowerPoint, Bethany. All right, one more time. Hold on. I might have the wrong window. Yeah. You do? Uh -oh. We're seeing him. Go, go, go back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I see your meeting agenda. This is the comedy of errors, isn't it? Okay, let's try. Talk about yeah, it, it, it first came up with the agenda. Hold on now. It takes, it, there's a little bit of a delay, it seems like. Now let's try. All right. There it is. Hey. Yay! <laughs> All right. Um, and let's hope the slides change when you push the button. <laughs> Okay, good evening, trustees. Um, it's nice to meet you virtually, Brady. Um, I anticipate, uh, although I'm hopeful you don't see me as much as the rest of the board has seen me in the last year or so. <laughs> um, I'm here tonight for a short presentation, uh, which will be revisiting and perhaps help you vis visualize some of the information in the memo um, in tonight's packet on this agenda item and then have time for questions and discussion. Um, we also have Mark Painter from Holland and Hart online with us tonight, um, representing their request team, and he's also available for questions. Do we really need to visualize a sewer line? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe not that not in the <laughs> Let's do the, the high level view, Michelle. How about that? Okay. All, right. All right, so did it advance? Are we good there? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure if you're seeing this, so I'm going to move you guys out of the way just a second. There we go. Um, okay, so with this agenda item, the board is considering approval and a recommendation to City Council related to a request from the Mary Beth Kent Family Trust and representatives for a permanent, non-exclusive sewer line easement across a portion of Gebhardt Open Space. Uh, because the conveyance of an easement is an interest in open space land, this matter must be approved and recommended consistent with the, the, the disposal procedures of the city charter. 
I'm back. We're, uh, Bethany, can you hear us? Yeah. I can. Okay. Sorry, I just cut out for just a second there. Oh, yeah, okay. rewind like 10 seconds, whatever, whatever you said. Just 10 uh, seconds, so because, because the conveyance of an easement is an interest in open space land, this matter must be approved and recommended consistent with the disposal procedures of the city charter. I'll slow down. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Um, the site plan application. Oh, excuse me. Hang on one second. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think I skipped too many slides. Uh, okay, so um, the for background and to get your bearings, uh, since the South Boulder Road address is a little misleading <laughs> on this uh, uh, on what you've seen in the memo, um, the area we are discussing this evening is south and east of the S curve of 55th Street, located south of the East Boulder Recreation Center. Um, it lies west of our Gebhardt Open Space property and north of the Greenbelt Meadows subdivision. Let me direct you to the diagram in the lower left to understand the properties referenced in your memo. Um, and this presentation, which include the Kent property um, that you'll see, which is also uh, known as the proposed Peacock Place subdivision, uh, the Gebhardt open space and the existing Greenbelt Meadows subdivision. The Kemp family has owned their five and a half acre parcel since the 1960s and have recently applied to the city of Boulder for annexation and development of the site as Peacock Place. One of the primary motives for the annexation application is to gain city water and sewer service to the site after the domestic water well was infiltrated and damaged in the 2013 flood. And generally septic systems along South Boulder Creek are considered unfavorable by the city. The site plan application is required to demonstrate feasible connections to existing city utility services. So in February of 2023, our open space real estate staff received an open space disposal request from the work, excuse me, from the request team, which includes the Kents and Boulder Creek neighborhoods, proposing to connect the subdivision sanitary sewer to the existing city interceptor sewer in the Gebhardt open space. In order to follow charter provisions and to provide consistent review and consideration of disposal requests, open space staff worked with re the request team and utilized the department's license and disposal guidance to review the request. This was supplemented with information known to OSMP program staff in order to provide a staff recommendation to OSBT tonight. This includes consideration of the available alternatives as well as the impacts and benefits to the general public and OSMP land resources and programs. The Gebhardt open space property is approximately 105 acres and was acquired in 1971. It is located within the South Boulder Creek State Natural Area designed in, uh, designated excuse me, in 1999 which includes designated critical habitat for Preble's Benno jumping mouse, as well as important wetland and riparian resources. And to be detailed further uh, later this, in this meeting, the open space is also the site where staff are currently implementing actions associated with Gebhardt Integrated Site Project recommended by the OSBT in 2020. The focus of this site project is to restore and protect the valuable resources on this OSMP managed property while continuing to provide positive visitor experiences. While the area of this sewer line easement request is not identified for restoration in the ISP, it is in close proximity to the public trail and ditch crossing connecting the Greenbelt Meadows public access to the existing South Boulder Creek Trail corridor that will be formalized during the project's implementation. This land also provides buffer between the developed neighborhoods and the more sensitive habitat and resources along South Boulder Creek corridor to the east. Additionally, the specific area of the Gebhardt open space property associated with this request includes the head gate for the Howard Ditch and its super foster collateral, as well as existing above and below ground sanitary sewer and storm sewer utility infrastructure. These all have some level of associated ongoing maintenance and access activities with the likelihood of periodic disturbance and restoration needs separate from this proposed sewer line. These images reflect some of those existing utilities in the immediate vicinity of the requested sewer line easement.
The proposed Peacock Place subdivision lies north of the Greenbelt Meadows residential subdivision. The approved Greenbelt Meadows subdivision plat includes an outlaw dedicated for public utilities, which is currently owned and maintained by the Greenbelt Meadows Homeowners, Homeowners Association as, as a neighborhood park and manicured green space. This outlaw includes the city's existing sewer main and the subdivision sewer connection as, and is an available and feasible alternative sewer connection for the proposed Peacock Place subdivision. However, the neighbors and Greenbelt Meadows HOA have expressed strong opposition and a preference to locate the sewer connection on open space property versus the outlaw, as well as the potential for formal action to prevent the use of the outlaw. While both the request team's council and city attorney for planning and development services believe the plat language provides for installation and maintenance of public utilities across the outlaw, the request team has indicated that defending any action brought by the HOA could be costly enough to this affordable housing project to make it unpractical, uh, unpractical and also notes that construction of the outlawed alternative would be more costly and have more significant surface disturbance to lands immediate, immediately adjacent to the open space. The proposed easement location as seen in this image is mostly disturbed non-native vegetation adjacent to residential development, boundary fences, and ditch and utility infrastructure. While located within or adjacent to mapped areas of important natural resources and habitats, OSMP resource and stewardship and other program staff have reviewed the request and have not identified sensitive or rare resources in the proposed easement area. If this sewer connection is approved and constructed, no long-term impacts to the planned open space uses of the property are expected. And if rare or sensitive resources are found within the <clears throat> proposed easement area, the alignment or construction schedule would be adjusted as determined by OSMP staff. While OSMP staff would prefer the sewer line connection be located in the HOA outlaw, the request team has detailed the likely conflicts, the conflicts that could ensue. In reviewing the existing resources and potential impacts, OSMP staff does believe construction disturbance can be satisfactorily restored with, with OSMP guidance and that the potential of ongoing impacts from maintaining the sewer line are in an area with existing utilities and access needs, which is likely subject to repeated intrusion and disturbance. The request team submitted detailed information demonstrating how the proposed Peacock Place subdivision could benefit the general public by providing affordable housing and outlines how it supports certain development policies in, in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. They have also proposed benefits to the OSMP program and balance temporary and permanent impacts to the open space property. If approved, the request team will pay $515 for the easement interest in the property, convey a permanent access easement to the city to cross their site from 55th Street for OSMP and utilities construction, maintenance, management, and enforcement access on the Gebhard property. This formalized pedestrian and vehicular access would be valuable to OSMP and the city as access in this area west of the creek has historically been problematic as identified in the Gebhardt ISP where a stated management and implementation objective is to limit and manage vehicular access west of the creek. Additionally, in support of the restoration and trail improvement projects on the adjacent open space, the request team has offered to make a $5,000 contribution to the Gebhardt ISP capital improvement project. So to wrap up, the staff recommendation is being made after thorough analysis and research and discussions with the request team and with careful consideration of the alternatives and review of potential project impacts and possible benefits. The request team has worked diligently with open space staff to answer questions and provide information to advance this easement request. OSMP staff have considered impacts which are limited to an area of existing utilities and where construction and access impacts can be mitigated. OSMP program staff have provided feedback on the proposed sewer line easement determining there will, be, there will not be significant or permanent impact to natural resources and identifying it as an existing utility corridor where limited but ongoing access disturbance is already likely. Additionally, the easement will have specific restoration requirements, including weed control, both for construction and major repair or reconstruction needs in the future. 
The request team would not only pay for the easement interest in the open space as required, but are willing to convey an important access easement to the city, as well as make a contribution towards continued restoration and trail improvement efforts on the adjacent open space. As part of the analysis, and in addition to following through on these proposed benefits to the OSMP program, staff does suggest the recommendation and approval of the request include conditions that the sewer line easement will only be conveyed if the annexation and development of the site is approved, since that's what would necessitate the sewer line connection. Um, and the request team update their outdated Prebles, uh, Prebles Meadow Jumping Mouse Habitat Assessment and consultation with the US Fish and Wildlife Service with a no effect determination to the satisfaction of open space staff. And that brings us to the staff recommendation and any questions you might have. Does anyone have any questions for Bethany, Michelle? I'm Bethany, I'm curious about the $5,000. Is that, is that typical that a, a contribution would be made um, outside of like purchase prices and fees and stuff? Is that, is that typical? I just, it is I don't not. Know. Like, so, yeah. yeah, it is not. Um, um, you've been through, you know, in, in your ten years so far, Michelle, you've been through um, a couple of disposals where you've seen kind of different, uh, different terms and different uh, impacts and benefits. Um, and so our guidance does allow for uh you know the the requesters to to bring forward um you know suggestions for for how they how how they or their request could benefit open space program and and they have offered this contribution um we can reject it we can turn it down um it, it, as as far as a you know I, I I hesitate to say it's a donation because it's part of a, a, a overall transaction but um, this you know it's a contribution recognizing that they're you know uh, the, the the importance of the projects and the the uh, open space that that they will be adjacent to. Are there other questions or comments? And if I could just clarify, Dave, so right now we'd be in clarifying questions. Right, right. We'll go to public hearing and then the board can right. have further discussion and comments and deliberation. Right. Brady. Um, I'm just curious, if, why would the Greenbelt Meadows HOA threaten a lawsuit over one to two manhole covers? And why are we so intimidated by that? But I'm just... If I can piggyback on that question, Bethany, uh, can you help us understand kind of the, the costs of uh, using the outlaw and yeah, what is preventing that being a you know viable alternative? Um, I can probably support that, but I think Mark, Mark Painter, who is available here, can can probably give you more background on the discussions they've had with the HOA and some of those the the costs and implications of of trying to go through the outlaw um, if if. Megan can unmute and allow Mark to join us. I think I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted? You are. Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, that's the first time I've been able to make my system work and Bethany's couldn't right away. So <laughs> I feel like I've accomplished something already tonight. Uh, thank you. And, and thank you for the question. First, let me just say that um, the Kents, uh, the Kents and Boulder Creek neighborhoods are very appreciative of the of the time and consideration of the trustees. So, um, thank you very much for that, and thanks for all the time staff put in on this, and in particular Bethany. Um, we've we've worked with her a lot on trying to understand a lot of this, and um, um, I've worked with Bethany before when a uh, when a proposal was not acceptable. So um, I I know she. Uh, she takes this very seriously and, and gave this due consideration. Um, there are two questions that were raised here, and I'll, I'll try and answer um, uh, both of them. One was the the five thousand dollar donation. The Kent's uh, Joe Kent grew up um, in part at this um, location where he wants to redo the house, and he would hunt on that land um, as a kid uh, before it was open space. So he has a great affinity for that land. And I think the $5,000 donation is just an additional benefit um, for 
uh, for open space and shows his respect for and his his love of the open space that's adjacent and why he wants to move back into the family home and restore it. So um, uh, it was a, a goodwill gesture on his part. Um, the the question about um, the Greenbelt Meadows, um, in your packet is a letter that came from Greenbelt Meadows. I am not, um, I, I don't agree with the um, legal analysis that came out of Greenbelt Meadows. And I, I think, um, either Janet Michaels or um, Hella Penawig doesn't agree with it either. It may be that they are just confusing various um, utility easements and the language of the platted outlot. Um, or it could be that they um, really feel strongly that they want to fight it. They do, um, they do not want uh, this line to go several hundred feet down through their park. Uh, that they maintain as a park and have it be disruptive to that and also have it be an ongoing potential maintenance issue. Um, Don Ash, who's worked with us on, on the utilities, we talked about the fact that when you have a several hundred foot um, sewer line, you've got a lot more potential for needing maintenance and therefore a lot more potential for going in to dig things up than if you have a 70 foot uh, line. So I think everybody was a little concerned about that impact. But right now, our concern has been that um, time and extra expense um, can really um, have a detrimental effect on a project like this. Because the margins when you are doing something that has so much affordable housing involved in it, um, the extra money that's there to actually withstand a long delay or pay a lot of extra expense in legal fees or to pay a lot of extra expense for a sewer line is significant and could, could just have a, um, a crushing effect on the, on the transaction itself. And, and the Kents really, um, you know, they'd love to just have their house and their land the way it was, but they have to annex it. And in order to annex it, they have to give community benefit to the city, which these days comes in the form of taking a big chunk of their land and dedicating it to affordable housing. So from that arises this need for the sewer line. And um, they're just trying to be good neighbors right now and not, um, not impose too much of an impact on, on um, Greenbelt Meadows and not have the potential delays and litigation that could go along with it. There's been saber rattling that way, but um, we don't know what they would do at this point, but that is physically the only other alternative um, is to go through their park. And they have expressed uh, with the city itself, they don't want this. They have voted as a board not to grant an easement to the Kents, um, you know, a voluntary easement that they could do instead of the utility easement that we think is there and is platted. Uh, so um, we do see a lot of resistance and and potential expense and delay that goes along with that. So intimidated, well, I think we're just being more practical than intimidated. Great, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Bethany, I have a, a question. And um, do you have a, a map that shows the delineation of the floodplains um, uh, regarding that property? I do, hang on, let me. Let me work on that. One second. <laughs> All right. What are you saying? Uh, we're still seeing you. <laughs> okay. Oh, hang on. It says, okay. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, it comes. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Never had some problem. Um, let's. Now we're seeing the motion language. Really? Okay. Oh, there. Okay. Can Can you uh, quickly summarize uh, what that map depicts? <laughs> sure. And let me see. I might be able to uh, use a. Um, well, I don't think you, you, you can see your mouse. What's that? We can see your mouse. Yeah, we can oh, see cool. your cursor. Yay, Zoom. Your okay. 
<laughs> okay, so the light blue is the 500 year flood zone, uh, the FEMA 500 year. Um, the darker blue that you see up here is the 100 year flood zone. Um, this is the Kent property, the P proposed Peacock Place, open space obviously over here. Um, so the green is the conveyance zone and pink is, is high hazard. So if you're visualizing where the, the sewer connection would be, it is in the it would be in the conveyance zone, which does allow um, underground utility infrastructure, obviously doesn't allow uh, homes or residential infrastructure or things like that, but um, does, does allow uh, utility infrastructure within the conveyance zone. Um, and then as far as uh, on the Kent property, um, a city uh, uh, land use code does allow development within 500 year flood zone, a huge amount of folder is in the 500 year flood zone. Um, and then there is, uh, is uh, to my knowledge, no proposed um, development or infrastructure. There's uh, wetlands and um, the, the pond you, you may have seen from other aerials um, is in this, this 100 year uh, zone. So um, the, the project plan has, has uh, for the, the property has worked a great deal um, around, you know, within the, the 500 year or no, you know, flood zone. Um, and then the proposed utility infrastructure would be allowed in the, the conveyance zone. So did the 2013 flood uh, flood the 100 year uh, flood plain on this property? It didn't. Um, and and if you have patience, I could probably bring that information up as well. But it um, it was quite far away. There was a, a bit over on the very western side of Hogan Pancos, which is across 55th um, of of um, overtopping of Dry Creek uh, that that did uh, that there was a, a, a bit of um, flooding on that, and then uh, was fairly limited to uh, what you see um, as far. I excuse me, <laughs> as far as the, um, uh, the pink areas here, uh, the high hazard zone of, of South Boulder Creek it, it was a limitation. Um, and I could uh, work on bringing that up during conversation if, if we want to, as far as where, what was inundated during the 2013 flood, it was not. Great, thanks. And uh, as, as part of the uh, development agreement, um, we talked the other day, uh, the proponents will be responsible for fencing the property between the privately owned property and open space and yep. whatever access that's necessary to access open space uh, as determined by the department will be the responsibility of the proponent as well. That's a yeah, yeah. If there was, if there was a future identified, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What's that? Uh, if there was future uh, access identified directly from the the subdivision or the development the developed site um, in the future, there is not currently. That would that would be the responsibility of the the subdivision or the HOA at the time. Um, currently, under the integrated site project, um, and I'm sorry, this kind of bleeds off the screen, but. Uh, the the uh, Peacock Place residents and and the the Kent property residents would would be um, accessing the the future trail from either the fifty fifth Street uh, access point or down in, down through Greenbelt Meadows. And so we'll uh, see those access uh, areas uh, later this evening. Later tonight. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'm stealing all of Eileen and Jeff's thunder. <laughs> we can skip our next item. Right? <laughs> no, we're looking forward to that. Oh, <laughs> sure. Uh, so are there any other uh, clarifying questions? Um, thank you for the great presentation. Yeah, thank, thanks. Uh, and you're going to stick around for a com uh, public comment and then the board's return to uh, comments? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, well, uh, I will open the uh, uh, public comment period. Is there anyone signed up, Sam? No one, we don't have anyone signed up in advance. Okay. Um, but if you are attending, uh, you're welcome to raise your hand. Just a reminder, there is either a raise hand function on the bottom of your screen, or you can click the participants icon and you'll see three dots in the bottom right-hand corner. You can click on that and see an option to raise your hand. And we do.
have one participant joining by phone. If you're joining by phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. And I'm not seeing any hands. Okay. Uh, in that case, we'll close the public comment and return the item to the board. Uh, are there any further comments or questions from the board? I think it's a nice gesture that they're offering the $5,000. It just feels a little weird and I'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether you want to take that, but it's just, it feels um, that it, it's odd that it's not wrapped up in the, the overall part of the transaction. It's a contribution that's very generous and I'm um, thankful that they're offering it, but I, I, it just feels out of place. Maybe it can be directed to the concert uh, the the boss group or something like that. Yeah, we can continue to consult with the city attorney's office to see how such a donation can and should and if it should be made. Um, this was part of the requester's package, and so that is something we could continue to work with city attorney's office on. I, I would just say that uh, there's sort of two uh, two areas, one which is very easy to determine uh, a cost, and, and that is what is the cost for a particular easement, and that's a real estate appraisal evaluation type of process in which that came in at what, $570 and some change. And then there's the cost of what about this, any staff time, anything else from long-term maintenance, providing access agreements to get in there, restoration, making sure that the restoration and and those sort of future costs that could come our way is a little bit more less tangible to actually put a dollar figure to. We know that there will be some staff time and some costs involved just in the, the maintenance of this project that would be bared upon the department. But I would say that we were we were we're not able to quantify, and that equals five thousand dollars per se. But uh, uh, but that that is a future cost that is not embedded right now into. Uh, uh, in, in terms of what the staff is calculated as what the cost to the department would be. Bethany, in that regard, you, in future conversations with the Kents, you might suggest that they consider making the donation to the department independent of uh, the project and, uh, and see if that's satisfactory. Uh, yeah, I can certainly do that. I think they did. Yeah, and they did take a uh, an interest when we were, you know, when we were discussing the the Gebhardt ISP and what was going on on adjacent lands. Right. But as far as being able to, uh, you know, volunteer for for potential trail projects, you know, some of the trail restoration or some of the restoration projects that were going on there, the timing may not align for kind of when they're, you know, the the residents would would come on board or things like that and so um i think you know they they were they were kind of navigating a way to to try to make an impact but again we can you know if if it if it feels awkward or it, it, does, it just doesn't fit in this particular situation i'll say that the you know uh, uh, paying the the easement value and you know uh providing us with an an access easement is is uh more than of, of of great value to the department without the the contribution the five thousand dollar contribution i mean you could express the uh board's um interest in uh or appreciation of the uh, suggested donation um and just say that you know there may be some other avenues uh for them to consider to do that uh, rather than yeah this particular project. So I have two uh, major uh, questions or, or comments. One is, uh, and the reason I've been asking about the floodplain is that I am greatly discomfited by the city's continuing to approve residential development in floodplains and then subsequently, and I, I'm I'm projecting this in the future, but subsequently asking the open space program to support putting mitigation structures 
on open space in order to protect the residential development. So uh, I'm, I, I'm not at all pleased that, um, that, again, we have a property that's in a delineated floodplain and in, in, invariably at, at some point in the future, if not tonight, um, it's going to uh, probably require some additional uh, mitigation in order to protect it. And uh, I think realistically that mitigation is always uh, targeted on open space. So I'm concerned about that. The second uh, thing that uh, uh, concerns me is that the open space program, uh, per, uh, a purpose of the open space program is not to support uh, residential development. And so for me personally, we would, we, the open space department would need to have significant benefits that would not accrue otherwise to the department in order to approve uh, development amenities uh, on open space, especially when there is an alternative available. And I, I understand that, you know, it, the potential uh, cost uh, requirement and time requirement um, and stuff like that. But I think it uh, should be a great concern to the board that um, in approving these requests, it, it just feels like more and more uh, the perception is, well, open space is vacant land and it's a lot cheaper and easier to, you know, to put, put the stuff there than it is um, to work through putting it uh, on private property. So those are two of my concerns. And so you can allay one of them by telling me that the benefits that we're getting as a department far outweigh the potential impacts. And the other one, as far as flood uh, hazard mitigation, uh, th there's nothing I expect you to tell me. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a concern that I think that we ought to be mindful of uh, in the future, but uh, it's nothing that uh, we can necessarily deal with at this point. So I would like to hear about the magnitude of the benefits that the department and the city are getting or is getting uh, for this. Uh, decision since it is not a purpose of open space to provide those amenities. Yeah, I, I, I can say, you know, in consideration of this and, and based on the location of the connection that the, the, the proposed benefits with, without the $5,000 contribution still outweigh um, the, the concerns and impacts um, you know, or the, the permanent or ongoing or long-term uh, concerns or impacts. Um, if it was a, a different area of the open space where there weren't existing utilities and infrastructure, you know, an, a, an incredible amount of, of infrastructure. And as you or a previous board, had, you know, uh, actually brought up and, and amended into the, the Gebhardt ISP was, was looking at all the vehicular and ongoing access that seemed to be occurring on that west side. And if we have the chance really to, to narrow that into one location for a lot of this, you know, the, the infrastructure, um, that's, that's incredibly beneficial, I think, to the department and the city. Great, thanks. Uh, any further comments or concerns, questions, Bree? I, I just want to say I, I appreciate your concerns, Dave, and um, I, it, it seems like it's the, the impacts of both alternatives are pretty minimal. I can understand why a HOA wouldn't want a trench and manhole covers on their outlaw that's become a, a park. Like, and, and I'm looking at the dates. You guys have been working on this for years. I, I take the staff recommendation very seriously. I'm relatively late to the table here, but I also just kind of want to echo what Dave said is, um, you know, from a from a, a, land, a land manager's perspective, I don't like the thought that if if somebody threatens legal action, or then then suddenly the the path of least resistance is open space. Um, and so, I guess I'm kind of restating to an extent what Dave said. Um, and I think in this case, it's the, the, the impacts are minimal. There's already existing infrastructure there. So again, I I I'm. I support the staff 
recommendation, but I, I, I do think that this could potentially be one piece of a, of a slippery slope, I think that Dave was mentioning. And I think sometimes in the support of uh, defending the integrity of our system, we have to do hard things. Uh, this is probably not that time, <laughs> but I just wanna, for the record, say that as a, as a trustee, um, I don't like that precedent that because there's a possibility for money and attorneys that, that the, 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 we'll, just, we'll just put it on the open space land. And one thing, uh, again, and I, this may be the final comment, for me, uh, there are, even, even though degraded, there are still habitat qualities on the open space uh, that's being considered. Um, and certainly those habitat qualities, even in a degraded state, are superior to the ones that are on outlot C. And so, especially where Prebles and perhaps even Spranthes are concerned, um, you know, there is potential uh, for them to be there. Uh, and, and I think if, if the restoration that we as the staff have, uh, have evaluated and called for um, is successful, that will improve the habitat quality. So that is a benefit uh, to the program. Um, but I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that the open space has uh, certain intrinsic values over and above, um, you know, what just generally undeveloped land. I mean, that, that provides some suitable habitat for uh, threatened species and that we, we should not take that value lightly. Um, so that's all I will say. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, uh, John. Yeah, uh, I, I would also like to say I, I appreciate your you know deep analysis on this. I appreciate your concerns, Dave and Brady. Um, you know, I uh, it seems like there's a lot of benefits here. Uh, you know, to the open space department with the access on the west side of the space. Um, and you know I'm, I'm supportive of uh, moving forward with the staff recommendation given that. So would uh, someone like to make the motion? Does that have to be read? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think it does. <laughs> would, we like to, <laughs> would we like to strike point five from the motion or? Well, uh, you could decide uh, and then uh, there could be a friendly amendment. I mean, we may take have to take two actions, but if you want to retain it or exclude it. Okay. Uh, I all, uh, do you want me to read the whole thing? I yes. Think, yes. <laughs> yeah. For the record. <laughs> that's, that's why you handed me the piece of paper, right? I see how, I see how it is. Um, uh, OSMP staff, uh, I motion that. Uh, I move. I move. Uh, I move the open space. that the Open Space Board of Trustees approve and recommend the City Council approve the request for a permanent, non-exclusive sewer line easement across a portion of the City of Boulder's Gephardt Open Space property for the installation, operation, maintenance, repair, and replacement of a sanitary sewer connection to serve the proposed Peacock Place subdivision at 5691 South Portal Road, pursuant to the disposal procedures of Article 12, Section 177 of the City of Boulder Charter and the following conditions have been met. Approved annexation and site review for the development of the 5691 South Boulder Road property that would require such sewer line connection. Uh, two updated Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse Habitat Assessments and consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with a no effect determination to the satisfaction of OSOP staff. Payment of $515 for the sewer line easement interest in OSMP property and conveyance of an access easement to the city from 55th Street across the 5691 South Boulder Road property to the adjacent Gephardt Open Space property for limited non public utility and open space construction and maintenance access and contribution of $5,000 to OSMP's Gephardt ISP capital improvement project. Is there a second? I'll second it. Uh, further discussion? So to be clear, we, are, we included 0.5. Uh, we did. Up to the 5,000, which I support. I think you look a gift horse in the mouth, as it were. <laughs> Thank you very much for that contribution. Um, 
that's my take on it. So I, I support that. Is there any further discussion? Uh, so we'll do. Uh, and Bethany, we lost you again, but we'll do a roll. Oh, there we go. Can you hear us, Bethany? I'm sorry. I can. Yeah, okay. I'm here. Okay. We'll, we'll do a, a roll call vote. It's been moved and seconded. Um, uh, John? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Brady? Yes. And I will vote yes as well. <laughs> 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 it passes four to zero. Thank you, uh, uh, both Mr. Painter and Bethany. We appreciate your participation. And uh, I'll echo John's um, uh, accolades about the staff work. Uh, I think a large part of my vote, and Brady already emphasized this, was uh, the staff's review of um, you know the various values that uh, are associated with with or adjacent to that property. Um, to the open space property. So thank you very much for all that uh, participated in that. Thank you all very much. Thank you. A break? Before, yeah, before we go in, we're about, we're ahead of schedule, which is great. Uh, we can certainly take a break. Why don't we, sure. can we Could, do a five minute? Yeah, we do and then we get, before we get into the budget. Right? Uh, sure. Maybe a 10 minute, and <laughs> please watch the budget. <laughs> you want to come back at 7.35? Yeah, it's 7.35. 7.35? <clears throat> You want to find out about the three consecutive versus just three? Or... I'm trying to find it. I... Yeah, I got a question for Gina. Maybe she could just quickly point it to me, point out where that's located. So let's see if she gets back to you. Okay, so we are we're recording again and we're back online. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we are now under matters from the department, and Dan, it's in your court. Yeah, yeah so we have. Uh, uh, Everybody's mics muted? Okay, there we go. So we have um, two main items under matters from the department tonight. First will be our second touch with the board on our 2024 budget. And uh, tonight will be a little bit more of an emphasis on CIP, but as you know, uh, through our process uh, change this year, we'll be incorporating a little bit of operating talk uh, into the memo tonight and into the presentation. Next month, it will be a little bit heavier on the operating side, then we'll bring it all together in July for a uh, CIP lottery fund and uh, operating recommendations, uh, staff recommendations uh, on our budget. And so with that, I think I'm going to first be turning it over to Cole Moffett, uh, our senior accountant for OSMP. So Cole will lead us through a short presentation. Sorry. Oh, there oh, you go. Good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good evening, trustees. Uh, my name is Cole Moffitt. As Dan said, and tonight, myself and Sam McQueen will be presenting the draft 2024 CIP and operating budget with focus on CIP. So here is a next slide. Here's a quick overview of what we'll be discussing tonight, um, including an update on the budget process, an overview of capital expenditures, a review of CIP trends and project highlights, and any time at the end for questions that you might have. And so as you can see from this calendar, tonight is the second touch on the 2024 budget in which we will focus on the proposed CIP and operating budgets. And we will convene again for the third touch on the budget materials on June 14th with department budgets due to central finance on June 23rd. So starting with a quick budget process update, the first adjustment to base was packaged and submitted to finance since we last met. It is still currently in review, but you can see a list of what the department proposed in attachment A of the memo. Capital carryover from previous years used to be on the first ATB list. However, it is now a separate process that runs concurrent with the ATB and is in process in review and should be posted here shortly. Uh, second, we received budget guidelines from the finance department on items such as you know, fleet repair and replacement cost, uh, computer replacement costs, et cetera. And OSMP expects to have an increase to our operating base in 2024 from these costs. So as shown in this pie chart, 
The four budget components in our fund financial consist of the operating budget, CIP, revenues, and reserves. Today's presentation and discussion will focus on CIP. Next month, we'll bring the CIP operating budget, revenues, and reserves all together. So diving into the CIP, here are the basic elements of a capital project. Projects should typically create, maintain, or enhance public infrastructure. They are discrete in nature with a defined start and end date, typically over $50,000 in costs or projects of the same type totaling more than 50,000. CIP projects typically do not build in FTE additions. The operating budget supports are standard hires and FTEs and we want to adhere to definitions and transparencies with planning board. The OSMP CIP represents about 20% of the overall budget. Ongoing projects that do not meet the definition of CIP are located in the operating budget, and these types of projects are not a major source of department expenditures. So looking further into our draft CIP, all projects have been reviewed for definition and many projects will be proposed this year as ongoing operational needs. An area where you will see this is in projects tied to ecosystem health and resilience focus area. And we would like to highlight this is not a reduction in funding for EHR, rather a shift from projects that have been historically funded through the CIP, which are now properly reclassed to operating starting in the 2024 budget. Sorry. And so based off this chart, here's a small sample size of a few projects that, like I said, have been historically funded as CIP that will be operating moving forward in 2024. And as shared during the April business meeting, uh, staff have reviewed the definition of CIP as part of the work planning process. If a high priority project has elements that are ongoing, contribute to core services or support the department's day-to-day -day work, it will be proposed as additional operating need in 2024. A detailed overview of the proposed operating budget adjustments will be presented during the June business meeting. And now I'll turn it over to Sam for CIP trends. Thanks, Cole. Uh, so turning to CIP trends now, the draft 2024 CIP is about $7.2 million, while OSMP expects to program additional revenues in 2024 over 2023 amounts. As Cole just mentioned, we took a closer look at the definition of CIP which will, which will result in many projects being proposed under the operating budget. And because of this, the 2024 CIP will be funded at an amount close to the 2023 CIP. Next slide, please. Um, this chart shows the department's investments in the four CIP categories, which were created with other departments in mind. Categories like new facilities don't always show up on our CIP, but it may be represented in other departments that are constructing new buildings. OSMP will invest more heavily in capital enhancement projects as a portion of the 2024 CIP than it has in previous years. And this can be attributed to operationalizing many projects that it would have been categorized as maintenance in the CIP in previous years. Sam, could, could I interrupt you real quick? Oh, yeah. So what does capital enhancement mean exactly? Yeah, so uh, I was actually, one of the things we're going to talk about in this slide, uh, it is a gray area. Uh, between maintenance and enhancement for some of our projects. So um, something, if we're thinking about trailheads as an example, uh, filling a pothole with gravel would be considered maintenance, but redefining the parking area or the entrances, we would consider that an enhancement. And so you'll see areas where we define something as an enhancement because we see that we're making an improvement. Um, but there's also an argument that there's a piece of maintenance in there. So that's sort of why you're, we try to be consistent with the categories over the years, but you'll see that we try to get really specific about what we're doing in our projects when we define something as an enhancement versus maintenance. So is the word enhancement uh, of, of city importance? Yes. Does it mean? And, and we, I think I mentioned this last month, we are not a clean fit into the city categories for, for much of our work. Um, most of what you're going to see as a maintenance definition is repair in place with no adjustments to footprint right. or anything like that, right? So um, when we're talking about things like ecological work or whatever, which is not infrastructure, there, there's, it, to your point, it's a gray area and we try our best to fit. 
Um, the categories do apply citywide. They are reported out citywide and by department, and those are used to um, inform priority-based budgeting. So across a bunch of the master plans and citywide plans, the, the focus in a budget downturn is take care of what you have in prioritize system maintenance. And so they use that enhancement category to inform reduction cycles. Um, and so I, I would say, I agree with Sam, in, in most of these enhancement projects, there is a large element of we're taking care of what we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, the cleanest example is if you acquire a piece of land, that's an enhancement to the system. If you build a brand new trailhead, like what's called for a coyote trailhead, North Tip, that's an enhancement. Um, you know, those okay. are the clean examples of what we have as enhancement projects, right? So, okay. great, thanks. Can, can I just follow up? Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and the only real practical implication is that CIP versus OPS impacts your cash reserve calculation. Is there um, some other, are there other uh, like practical implications of how the categorization happens? Yeah, and you can chime in too. I, so the way that we budget for operating is an assumption of base continuing in purpose. Something we would like to shift into operating this year. There, it is, you don't have to request it again in any subsequent year unless you're making a substantial change. And so it allows us to say in any given year, we will be doing ag fencing and we have the flexibility to determine what property that will be on and what the priorities are and go and deliver that work. With the CIP, um, it's, it's considered one-time funding instead of ongoing. And so when we do those calculations, we're if you add something to operating, like I, I colloquially say it's time six because we do a six year budget planning horizon. If it's a CIP, it can go into reserves, and if it's an operating, you have to use it in the current year? If it is in the operating budget and you do not utilize it in the current year, it goes to your fund balance to be reappropriated in a future year. Um, the way that that would work with CIP, so um, we're going to talk about this more next month, but with our reserve categories, we've had a number of, uh, actually many times um, in the department where we are using a reserve as a savings mechanism. For example, South Boulder Creek and Stream Flow, Gross Reservoir Expansion, where we knew we would have an obligation. We didn't know when it would hit. We it, it wouldn't have been appropriate at that time to say we're going to appropriate that money in the CIP because we didn't know when that obligation would come forward. So what we use in the reserves, um, we have contingency reserves, we have TABOR reserves, FEMA reserves, but we occasionally have project reserves. And then when it's time to call up that project, we would appropriate that through adjustment to base. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you have we covered most of the topics that needed to be covered. I appreciate that. Sorry. No, no, that's great. That's great. Um, okay. Next slide, please. So the next few slides then will focus on CIP alignment with the master plan. And we continue to incorporate master plan guidance in the CIP with an emphasis on tier one strategies and are excited to build on reporting of the CIP in this way from previous years. As a reminder, our CIP projects align with the five focus areas of the master plan and their corresponding strategies. They are ecosystem health and resilience, responsible recreation, stewardship and enjoyment, <clears throat> agriculture today and tomorrow, community connection, education and inclusion, and financial sustainability. So many of our projects address multiple master plan strategies and OSMP's work planning system also allows for each project to link up to three strategies. And we refer to these as primary, secondary, and tertiary strategies. Project managers have assigned percentages to each strategy. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick snapshot as a reminder of strategies identified in the master plan document. Just tier one strategies are shown here as an example, and the full list is included in the published master plan. Next slide, please. So to show how a single project is assigned various master plan strategies, we can look at the stock water planning for drought resilience and support of diversified agriculture project. It's captured in our analysis as follows. So 34% or $20,400 of funding is focused on the primary strategy, which is tier one ATT2, increased soil health and resilience. 33% or $19,800 is focused on the secondary strategy, tier one EHR1, preserve and restore important habitat blocks and corridors. And the remaining 33% or $19,800 is focused on the tertiary strategy, tier two ATT4, protect water resources in a warmer future. 
While some projects may focus different percentages on their primary, secondary, and tertiary strategies, or may not identify one of those categories, this percentage breakdown is a useful way to report master plan alignment. And the budget numbers that you'll see in the rest of this presentation incorporate this breakdown of projects by strategy. Next slide, please. In 2024, OSMP continues to invest most in tier one strategies, and this is consistent with the department's approach in the last five budget years since the master plan was approved. All master plan strategies are considered important, but tier one strategies were identified for acceleration and emphasis with more staff time and funding. Next slide, please. And different from previous years, this chart shows that the department is proposing projects that invest the most dollars into RRSE strategies in 2024. EHR strategies receive the highest investments in the 2023 CIP. And this can again be attributed to proposing many projects with ongoing maintenance features under the operating budget. So during the decision-making process, it was determined that many ongoing maintenance needs that were tied to EHR strategies would be more appropriately funded in the operating budget. We'll present operating budget details and master plan alignment in a similar way so the OSBT can get a better understanding of total investment in each of these focus areas. And then next slide, please. So this final slide details investments in each focus area, as you just saw on the previous slide, and examples of projects with some level of alignment with those focus areas. So as a reminder, the example projects listed on the right have some level of funding going toward the focus area where they're listed. You can see here that projects that align with a particular focus area support a handful of topics. A more detailed list of projects and their alignment with the master plan strategies is included in this month's packet. And next slide, please. So closing out, does the OSBT have any clarifying questions regarding the department's draft 2024 CIP and operating budget? Yeah. What so the percentages that you attribute to these expenses to different strategies? Is there presumably is it methodology behind that? I'm just curious, yeah, just curious if you could just tell us how that works. Yeah, yeah. So um, in one of the slides uh, had shown just an example of one of the projects. It's in the packet as well. It's, um, we take each project and then assign a percentage of that project that is assigned to each of the strategies. So for instance, if 50% is attributed to one of our financial sustainability strategies taking care of what we have, it'll show up in our, our total budget number uh, as 50% of that project. So we, we really try to break it down by each project individually and then show you the totals wrapped up. Um, and I think what you're getting at is how do we come up with that 50% in this yeah. example? Yeah, so our project managers um, really look at the features of each of the projects and what the, the purpose was of that strategy were um, and try to come up with how much of this project is actually going to be tied to, you know, is it half of, uh, half of the work being done in this project really is assigned to taking care of what we have in that example versus a different strategy that we could have assigned some time to. Um, and yeah, so it's it's sort of, uh, it's something that we're working on to improve. It's our third year of doing it. And so we're really trying to make sure that we get those percentages right. But we recognize that there's probably some areas where we need to standardize a little bit better. But our project managers, I do think, have been very thoughtful about the percentages that they assign. So um, we've been really, uh, trying to wrap those numbers up and show you kind of where where our thinking is and those alignments. Ready to just, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> just so we have uh, to uh, have a project considered, we, we have what we call a project charter, which is our Encompass, which is our main software system for our, our work planning tracking. And you literally, a project manager literally has a number of different fields that they would need to describe that project in. And one of them is the master plan alignment that then would be uh, uh, checked out. Those project charters are then checked by the deputies of those service areas. So it goes from the project manager up to the deputy level just to make sure for the consistency. I would describe it as a mix of science and art. Um, yes. It's, yeah. it's, we're never, there's, there is never, it's never going to be a purely scientific 100% accurate way. If you get 10 project managers in the room and you ask them to take this project and assign percentages to it, you probably get 10 different answers. But I think we're pretty confident that uh, our project managers are very familiar with the master plan. It does have a level of sort of 
checks and balance with the deputies of also weighing in on that decision. So seems like a lot of work, but it's also, <laughs> you know, a, a whole different dimension of your accounting, but also a really interesting way to report back. You're putting resources where plan is. I, I, it's just new. I haven't seen yes yeah. done before. We do we do the same thing with um, what other staff in your department in this department needs to be associated with your project. So we also then have that report in which we could say, you know, um, Mark here has been assigned five thousand hours worth of time that they they're needed on project. He only works one one thousand eight hundred hours. That's impossible. So then that allows us to go and say, are, are certain staff being overloaded with the collection of projects will be brought forward this year? So that's another feature of what a project manager needs to uh, enter is what other staff are implicated from this project and how, much, uh, how many hours are you gonna be asking of their time? So those are two different important features that we've built in over the last five well, years. That's up to over 2080. You know. <laughs> we know we that it sounds we accurate. It. <laughs> if it's over 2080. <laughs> no, I just one more yeah. question. Well, I, I just want to put it in, in a little context too of just comparing. So we have the fund financial, which Cole referenced, which is our um, financial statement that rolls up into our state financial reporting, city financial reporting. And then the master plan tracking, I mean the other the other reason that that's important to uh, well, the primary reason. Um, that that's important to us is when we do our annual reporting and, and um, five-year reporting on master plan progress. The first year after the plan was adopted, we uh, we did not use three strategies and we used one. And when we came to present, actually staff felt very uncomfortable and we got feedback from the board at that time to say, these strategies are really interconnected. And when you have a report out that says, you know, 100% went into whatever one strategy is, it appears as though we're not investing in these other strategies, which feel really interrelated. We are making progress on those things. And so after, to your point, we've done this three years because the, the first year we did not have this practice. And so um, the system is limitless. We could have 10 strategies. It just, it got to a place of like, okay, to the, to the art point, let's find something that feels realistic to accomplish and still gets at the interconnectedness of that work. The master plan has these levers in it that says, you know, EHR investment over 10 years needs to be between this percent and this percent. And so that allows us to, to uh, report out on whether or not we're following up on that. Exactly. And then, you know, it's our first master plan. And I, I think one of the areas of learning for us is we, we built those targets specific to the CIP and we did not, factor in non-personnel budgets into the way that we're tracking those things. And so CCEI, as an example, the bulk of their work is operating. It's education programming, rangering, welcoming, visitor, things like that. And so when we when we give you these reports and we're like our cumulative five-year investment in CCI is actually under target in the master plan uh, because CIP is not the right mechanism to fund that. Exactly. So I think what we would be looking to do in like the five-year update is to broaden that definition to say, yes, those targets are right, but we need to weigh both non-personnel and CIP budgets and, and coming up with those numbers. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right, last question. So it seems to be that if, if something goes into operations, it becomes part of base, which means it's the presumption is it will be done six times over six years. Yeah. So does that, that means presumably that then those expenses don't get in nearly as much scrutiny. That has been why um, that is part of the reason why that we have funded things in the way that we have in the past. So the financial systems that we had made tracking and reporting on those operating things really challenging. There's a lot of day-to-day -day budget management that these folks do to say in a current year budget, who's on track to spend, who's underspending, overspending, why, you know, what are the barriers to getting work done? What we have now, last year was the city's first year with a system called OpenGov. And then through this budget cycle in 2024, they're launching a workforce planning tool, which is something we've not had access to in the past. And now we have our work planning system up and running, which allows us to do that level of tracking. So for any ongoing service, we have a, we have a project the way that Dan described in the work plan system now, where, for, you know, agriculture, I'll just stick with that same example. If fencing is going to move from CIP and operating, and we say we're going to do between five and 7,000 linear feet of fence, we now have the way to track that that we didn't have in the past. Uh, an example that always sticks out to me is when we got here, the junior ranger program was funded out of CIP. 
it's been it's been around for 50 years. <laughs> We're going to keep doing it. And and that was because, you know, every year we had to figure out what is minimum wage going to be? How many kids can we hire? How are we going to track and report? And those are things we can now do much more easily on the operating side. So on the fencing example, if you if you said, OK, we're going to put, say, 100 grand of fencing budget into the ops and the presumptions that will happen for six years. Yeah. What happens on year three when you're like, that was wrong? Uh, but it's part of base. Is there an internal, you know, kind of, you know, well, we'll just kind of put it over here and it won't get scrutiny or does it get called on again? Do we, does it get sunlight again? Like, how does that work? Yeah, we have, um, I would say two mechanisms for that. So we have a work plan steering team and um, that group, it's deputies and some project managers, Sam Cole, uh, some of our tech staff. We're calling up um, emergent projects, unplanned projects, and then reallocations from base. And so say we heard from the fencing group, which this is a real example, uh, Marshall Fire Fencing needs to trump our mm -hmm. typical ag fencing. This is something playing out right now. We would say, okay, you have your Marshall Fire money. The priority is to, to deliver contracts on that. If we're gonna have unspent money on the base fencing, um, what is the greatest need in your work group? Who has capacity to spend that money? And just for that one year, we would make a decision at that level to reallocate. If that became something ongoing, another live example is cost of materials is through the roof. So we would say, okay, this is going to be an ongoing shift. We're gonna shift base. And then you would see that as a budget request in, in the next year. Okay, but if nothing happens to fencing, we won't see it for six years. Correct. Yeah, um, we obviously, so we have all of this data in our financial system. And so we have the ability to report out on those things. So uh, things that we look at would be three year actual spend. So do we have a pattern in any program where people are underspending or overspending money that we need to address? Um, like we, we have that data kind of at our fingertips and could share that out, you know, if we had specific interest areas, but that's the idea once it's part of base. That's why we spend so much of our time on CIP, even though it's 20% of our budget is because the rest is sort of presumed to be ongoing and salaries don't change all that much, you know, things like that. Thank you. Great. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, back to Brady's first question. When, and I didn't realize um, that it was really done on a percentage, but like on page 16, when we're talking about the North Trail study, or the implementation of Wonderland Lake, it's, it's um, allocated to like, um, I think four different lines. It's a total of three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. You're you're taking that project, that scope of three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. I thought it was more like um, the components of the of the project, and you're doing it more bottoms up. But it sounds like it's more top down. Like uh, the feeling is that um, one hundred eight thousand thousand uh, dollars would be going to connect to outdoors um, versus. Um, Twenty thousand to support a range of passive recreation experiences versus one hundred and five thousand in investing in the workforce development and operational needs. Yeah, and I think that what you're pointing out is really a feature of what the focus is for 2024 on that project. Um, this is we continue we funded this one for 2023 also, and the focus would have was a little bit different in the. Um, so the strategies that were uh, presented in 2023 would have been a little bit different. I think for this one, um, there's more of a focus on renovating the nature center. Um, there's restoration of the shoreline along the peninsula. And so I think that's how the percentages got assigned differently that you probably expect to see in this, this large project. Um, if you look back at the 2023 assignments for each of the master plan strategies, it, it was likely a different outcome. Uh, different breakdown for the strategies because of the focus of the project that year. Because last year we approved the North Sky Trail as a big win that we, we're not going to see that's done, even though the project's not done, but the, the approval of that CIP budget is done. Is this year's money, yeah. Yeah, and this year, yeah, this year. <laughs> <laughs> last year we approved it and this year it gets spent. But so we're not going to see that again unless you have some overages and you need additional funds. But the, and with this back to the sort of allocation, you're looking at that project and you're um, figuring out the different components that go toward the different focus areas in that particular year of funding. For That's that exactly right. Yeah, I mean, to, to Lauren's point when, uh, and to Dan's point when they were talking about our Compass system that we use to um, 
track this information. Our project managers do go in multiple times. We have these, these sprints where we ask them to input new information and update information. And so at least twice a year, they're going in and making sure that they have the right strategies assigned um, and updating information. And then we have a point of the year where we say pencils down. And at that point, we expect that strategies have probably changed from the year before if they've updated um, what the purpose of the, the project is and what they're asking for for the, the next fiscal year. Uh, as opposed to what they asked for in the previous fiscal year. So I think you'll find that, um, that for a lot, you, you've brought up, I think, probably one of the examples that has the most change in strategies from year to year, but we probably have a few other examples where the strategies have changed from what we had presented in 2023. Great, I have uh, one question on carryover that I, probably should know the answer to, but I can't. If I know it. I, if I don't, <laughs> Co will. <laughs> so, uh, so what happens to, how is carryover handled? I mean, it's a $12 million, almost a, a $12 million dollar component. So how is it handled? Yeah, and in the past, and just correct me and add, <laughs> Cole's our carryover expert these days. Um, in the past, the way that that was handled, so you have budget appropriated, say in 2022, um, maybe we encumbered the funds or maybe we're planning to early the following year or whatever. In the past, you would need to carry over that money and it would be posted through adjustment to base. Council would give you the approval to carry over the money. The change in thinking now um, in the finance department is what council approved was the dollar amount to go and do that specific project. And so if you are still doing that project and if that dollar amount is right, you already have approval to go and execute that work and all that's changed is really the schedule around when you're going to be able to do it. And so it, to Cole's point, it's now a concurrent process um, where finance is still auditing that, still reviewing that. Anytime we overspend a project budget, we have to make that whole before they'll allow us to roll into the next year. But it's, it's something that they don't want to put back on the council docket because the council has already approved the list of projects. With us, you're correct, that number is, is a lot of money. Um, what five million of that is the the balance on the acquisition fund, and so we're carrying that to make sure we have appropriated appropriated dollars for high priority acquisitions. And then what we do through work plan steering team through the director's team is we would be looking um, at the end of every year. Do we have clear scope construction timelines? Is the project no longer going to happen, and we need to deobligate that money? If we decided to do that, so an example um, that we're working through right now. We're in permitting delays on some trailhead projects that now won't be done until 2025. So our intention at the end of the year would be to deobligate that money, not carry it forward, and then request it in the year construction will actually occur, which will be 2025, 2026. So you would be seeing that um, through the budget process again. So when you deobligate, then what, what happens? The money goes to fund balance. So it's available to be reappropriated right. to a different project. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, we're looking forward to the next iteration. And uh, it, I, again, I think uh, this reflects a far more sophisticated uh, budgeting process than I remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's Not a new software. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so, oh yeah, of course. And these are the folks that know it. I just, uh, I'm just talking. <laughs> Great. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, thanks y'all. So we're going to be moving on to our second uh, matters from the department, which is an update on implementing a, a site plan that was brought before you all uh, about three years ago. And um, Jeff Haley and Eileen Flax are going to be uh, working us through this one, but. Uh, and Jeff will explain a little bit about just the terminology site plans because we uh, we always have we typically always have a site management plan at work somewhere on the system, uh, and this was a big focus in 2018, 2019, and uh, I believe approval in 2020 of a particular site plan. And uh, uh, at, at times throughout the year or, or throughout the years, there is a site plan that we might want to just keep you updated on on certain elements of it as we go through implementation. That's the case with uh, this particular one. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff Haley, our Deputy of Trails and Facilities, who I think will say some opening remarks and then turn things over to Eileen. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so yeah, we're Gebhardt Integrated Site Project. Um, and as Dan mentioned, 
obviously Michelle, John, Brady, each of you are relatively new since this project started many years ago. Um, so basically, the, the integrated site plan project, ISP, as you'll hear us talk about, obviously Bethany Collins just mentioned earlier um, in her presentation, her item that we're, we're talking about the same site and location. And that's really what an ISP integrated site project is. It's a distinct geographical site or location where there's a lot of um, interest or complexities there. And so we take a moment as a staff team to just kind of look at the site, if there's ecological concerns or, or values or recreation concerns or those sorts of things and really figure out what's the holistic comprehensive approach to this site. So that's what Bethany was mentioning with some of those illustrations, talking about trails and access, et cetera. Um, you'll, you've heard a little bit about Fort Chambers. That's another project that you can kind of start to think about like a site integrated site project. Gun Barrel, we have some integrated site projects going on there too. Why is this one unique? As Dan mentioned, um, periodically we'll bring these to the board. Um, this one's unique because it is along South Boulder Creek, a very sensitive ecosystem with a lot of interest. Um, we've been working on for many years. It took a pause. You'll hear a, a bit more about that in a moment. And so we're actually in the implementation phase and we just make sure we're always reminding the board about what we're learning and what we're working on as well as our stakeholders. Uh, we've been doing similar updates with the neighbors at Greenbelt Meadows and other surrounding neighborhoods. So tonight, um, really what we hope to achieve and the key outcome is again, to familiarize you with the project, a brief history of where we've been, um, look at a lot of the implementation priorities, um, talk about some that are very um, clear cut and defined and we're moving forward with construction and then others that we're still considering and getting more information and, and learning more about. So I'll kind of leave it at that. Eileen and I both will kind of co-present this evening just to share more conversational so you get all the information that you'd like. Feel free to stop us at any time as we're going through to ask questions. Um, you don't necessarily have to wait till the end. So, and Eileen Flax is an amazing staff person who's been assigned this project um, since she's been with our team has done a tremendous job just kind of bringing it back and getting it going. So I'll let you take over. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Hal. I'm going to just walk you through some of the history of the project and bring you up to the to the current date. So this site has had a lot of planning efforts that have gone into it. I'm just going to orient you a little bit, although Bethany it's kind of oriented familiar. you. Yeah. <laughs> and it should. Good job. So um, we're looking at the area just east of the just east of the East Boulder Community Center. So it includes the South Boulder Creek Trail and South Boulder Creek through this area. We're just north of South Boulder Road and east of 55th Street. So back in 1998, shortly after the Greenbelt Meadows community was developed, the South Boulder Creek Area Management Plan identified the need to have a bridge connecting folks from the west side over to the east side to get them to that trail um, because they have an access to the west side but no way to get to that trail. And the community has really enjoyed using that west side access over the last 25 years because it's really the only place that they can get to. Um, the visitor master plan in 2005 identified this as a natural area the Grassland Ecosystem Management Plan in 2010 really clarified that it's important not to have uh, trails on all surrounding a water body or on both sides of a water body so that those west side trails were really an issue. And then, of course, the 2019 Master Plan has been guiding a lot of our work um, at Gephardt. Um, this is such a special place, and that's um, I, that's clear by all the regulatory um, pieces of this site. It is a designated state natural area. The um, the waters in this area, the water resources are incredible, from the wetlands to the floodplain, and all of the ditches and utility easements that come through there associated with water. And then with all the ecological um, resources, the Ute Ladies Tresses and the Preble's Jumping Mouse, both, tea, both in, um, listed as threatened under T&E, um, the Northern Leopard Frog and nesting birds and the rare communities. It's just really rich with ecosystem benefits. And then there's a whole layer of passive recreation that happens in this corridor as well. All of the different passive recs 
resources that we have on our system happen here. And we have all this infrastructure that um, is in this multimodal corridor. So we have agriculture and ditches and sanitary and stormwater, and then um, the trail maintenance that has to happen. So there's a lot going on in this very constrained corridor. So um, in January 2018, the ISP project began and with goals that related to ec ecology in terms of improving habitat and then improving visitor experience and then using this as an opportunity to build community, so to strengthen neighborhood relations. Um, so that was the basis of the ISP charter. There was a robust public process that went forward over a year of internal through OSMP and with the public back and forth, working through concepts and coming together to, um, to develop a plan, a preferred alternative plan. And that plan came to the OSBT back in um, January of 2020. And there was a unanimous recommendation to move forward with the preferred alternative. Yeah. Elena, I will just mention when did we meet with the neighbors more recently? Yeah, in, in February. February. So we even kind of met back with a lot of the folks this year um, to kind of go through a lot of the current ideas. So still continuing the engagement is what I'd like to convey. Right on. So still on board? Generally. Yeah. Um, and we can talk more about that in just a little bit on some of the current work that's going on. So just broadly, the preferred alternative, the blue line is South Boulder Creek. The green areas show areas for restoration. So areas that will have the um, social trails closed off um, and have those areas restored. The dashed lines are fences and trails through the area. And um, the, the West Side Trail is, or the West Side Social Trail is not included on this plan, but it pretty much follows the creek all along the west side here. In addition to the many directions included in the preferred alternative, there is also a whole set of final management guidance under these headings, these three buckets that relate to ecology and uh, visitor use and community. And I'm not, we're not gonna touch on all of these, but these kind of serve to flesh out the, the directives in the um, preferred alternative. And we'll include these in our discussion as we move forward. So once the preferred alternative plan was approved, of course we had COVID and then the New Zealand mud snails were, um, were found in South Boulder Creek. And so the project really went on pause to try to figure out what to do about management through this area um, to responsibly manage the snails and figure out next steps on the Gephardt ISP project. Um, and so we have a plan in place for dealing with the snails and we're moving forward with our um, implementation, which brings us to now. Um, and we, now we want to uh, update you on how we are addressing all of the, the pieces of the preferred alternative and, and move forward and share that information with you. Um, so these slides are a little dense and a little wordy, but what's going on here is the top of it the, in red is the language that's included in the preferred alternative that shows up there. And then the final management guidance under those different headings is follows that and then what we're doing in terms of design right now and their next steps. So I'm not going to read all of this to you all, but just to give you an orientation of like we're building on all and trying to implement all of the directives that we have, all that guidance. So primarily this is a restoration project. We are trying to get that west side to be the, the rich habitat that it can be um, to restore those trails and um, eliminate those as the ongoing corridor of use that they are. Um, and that's gonna happen through um, restoring those trails, all kinds of new plantings, including cottonwoods and upland and riparian shrubs, and then bank stabilization and erosion control along the creek itself um, through subtraction, taking out the invasive species like crack willows and the suckers that are part of that, the privet and teasel, and even um, we're looking at removing smooth brome in some areas and trying to kind of shift the areas that are in that smooth broom. Um, we're gonna be including fencing and signage to 
reinforce that air, the areas that will be um, closed off to the public. And those pieces were pretty much ready to move forward with final design and permitting on restoration components. The bridge is the most significant piece of infrastructure here. It's a big deal to get in a bridge. You saw the floodplain and we're talking about putting a bridge in really low. So working through the floodplain um, considerations associated with that have been really interesting. Um, we're looking at a bridge that's really pretty similar to the one that's north of, um, that's just east of the East Boulder Community Center. Um, similar detailing, similar width, but this will not be supporting bicycle use across it. This is just gonna be for pedestrians. Um, we've identified a location that's about 100 feet upstream, and that has to do with the uh, creek hydraulics and um, impacts to the floodplain, just trying to get it to sit in there nicely. Um, again, we're up to final design and permitting on this piece of the project. We've, we've moved forward with, with this and, and are ready to move forward on the next steps there. Um, we're going to include a trail that gets that formalizes the social trail along that west side to get from the Greenbelt Meadows neighborhood up to the bridge. Um, this, of course, does mean that we have a little segment of trail that is on both sides of the creek, but this is an important way. It's the bridge is in the best location, and so we need this, this trail to connect to them. Um, we'll be crossing over the Howard Ditch and, and coordinating with the ditch company on that um, on that crossing. I've met with them already. I got to go to their annual meeting, which was really fun. And uh, we'll continue to coordinate with the ditch on, on having this crossing over that, that area. The ditch yeah. company annual meeting was fun. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> I, for I, it was around a dining room table and it was great. It was okay. great. I got to meet the ditch rider and all my fantasies about that came through. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I will add on this slide in particular, and Dave, I think you kind of referenced this in our previous agenda item. As you can see, neighborhood connections, and that's really the, the cornerstone of this whole project is the folks on the, the west side of the creek and the neighborhoods don't have a direct access to east, the east side of the creek where the designated trail is. So this, the bridge is really kind of the, the paramount piece of the project to allow that access. But then also, Dave, as you were pointing out, having designated access points from each of those neighborhoods to that bridge to cross over. So you can see specifically in this illustration, as Eileen was mentioning from Greenbelt Meadows, they can kind of traverse along the creek up to the north, cross the bridge. And if you just look at the aerial photo, the bridge is almost right in between where that future Peacock Place neighborhood subdivision will be in Greenbelt. And then there's that also, well, we haven't gotten to the 55th connector yet, but just to jump ahead, this line that Eileen's indicating with the mouse, um, folks can also go to the north and then connect down as well. So there's two key access points from the west to the east. Um, that will be included. So just to make that connection back to the previous topic. Thanks. Right. So the separated trail, um, the ISP identifies that within the existing trail corridor of South Boulder Creek that we should create separated paths for pedestrians only and then have a separate trail for multiple use. And um, these are actually a little bit um, excerpted the final management guidance is directing us to separate a pedestrian only path from the multi-use path. path. Um, there are concerns related to higher speed bike travel and we're directed to assess the feasibility of wider buffers between the separated pedestrian and multi-use paths on the east side. So this desire for a separated trail really comes out of a desire for safety and visitor experience along there. Um, there in, in addressing the need to close those west side social trails, the community saw the model that's working north of the East Boulder Community Center bridge where there's a 10 foot with concrete multi-use trail and then a separated pedestrian trail that's right along the creek. Um, and that model works so, so nicely and it would be beautiful to just be able to follow that model down on the south end. Um, Are we doing the paved? 
multi-use trail on that side? Um, we were not talking about a paved trail. We were just talking about a separated pedestrian trail was, was the idea that there would be a, an opportunity to have a pedestrian only experience. If you've walked on this trail, you know, it's very popular. It's a, it's a beautiful trail. It feels great to be on it. And then you'll have a group of runners, you know, the track team comes by you and it's a little overwhelming. You have some bicycles speeding by you and it's a little overwhelming and it really shifts the experience that you're having on that trail. Um, and so that's, it's a real concern that there, there is so much use on that trail and what the experience is there. And that's, that's really what the desire to have the separated trail is coming from. So the proposal is that the, the trail and connector there west of the creek would be pedestrian only? So, so this dash line, this kind of heavy dash line is, uh -huh. is the South Boulder Creek Trail. And the ISP, the preferred alternative, said, find a way to put a separated trail in mm -hmm. here. You guys work on that. And that is what we have been working on. There is uh, some direction to try to find a place that is west of that trail, closer to the creek. Again, really similar to what's going on mm -hmm. on the north side, um, with the understanding that there was additional design that needed to happen. And that's the work that we have been doing. John, the, the new bridge and then the West Side Connector Trail would be pedestrian only. Right. Okay. Yeah, there wouldn't be a separated trail on the West Side. On the West Side. Right. And given that you are allowing bikes on the East Side, um, so I apologize if I'm jumping ahead yeah. here with a question. Uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. why would you not allow them on the East Side for people that might be trying to, or not allow them on the West Side for people that are trying to get over to the East Side? I think we'll talk about that, but okay. that is the encouragement for bicyclists to use the existing right. East Boulder uh, so Creek crossing to go and up to get on the and to get onto the multi-use path then and uh, continue on towards South Boulder Road using that. Okay. So that is sort that of makes a, a desired looped vision. Cool. We've got some so illustration to show that. Right? So that's the why. So. We have not yet finalized a separated pedestrian trail route on the east side of South Boulder Creek. We have not yet been able to identify a location within this very constrained mm -hmm. corridor. It's rich with wetlands and with all of, all of what's going on there. Um, you, we talked about all of the regulatory considerations. There's also a, a, a parallel um, regulatory review from both federal government, from the state government, from county government, and from city governments. And, and so all of those, those need to come into play in how we um, manage these resources on this, on this area. So we are continuing to work through this, but have not yet been able to identify a route. Um, we are in the process. We're working with transportation staff at the city and county. We're, we're um, doing additional research and collecting data on how people are using this. And we hope to do some additional research in terms of how the um, bikeway, the thir Route 36 bikeway connects up to this area and what uses are coming in through that area. Um, we are looking at our trail management objectives and trying to figure out what we can do within the corridor itself in terms of um, improving safety, both through surfacing, the width, the um, sinuosity, all of those pieces of it. And we're doing additional mapping of wetlands currently that may help us to identify an alignment that could, could possibly work through that area. Um, there's a lot more work to do. You see our next steps, the visitor use and behaviors assessment, 36 bikeway assessment, trail alignment assessment, coordinating with the city, and then preliminary and final design and permitting. So we're still working on this piece and, and we're, it's, it's challenging. This is a, a big challenge. So the South Boulder Road underpass included in this project? It has become included <laughs> in this project because, um, you know, sometimes to make, to solve a problem, you have to make it bigger. And that's kind of what we've gotten to is trying, trying to make this problem bigger in order to solve it. And so uh, this isn't exactly related, but um, are the swallow nests that are in there, are they still intact and we're still making sure they stay intact? I don't know about the swallow nest, I'm sorry. We feed them every night. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good. Well, I'm just There's concerned. plenty of mosquitoes over there I'm to feed them. With, you know, the increased use, especially bike mm -hmm. use, 
you know, through there that, uh, you know, they, they, they do nest there. And the city at one time, well, especially on East Boulder Rec Center, was removing uh, swallow nests. Um, and I want to make sure that we are not involved in that, that swallow nests are, are killing swallows yeah, are, are inviolate. Yeah. <laughs> they are where they are. Right. Yeah. So great. That's a great point, Dave. Um, and I'll just say when when Eileen mentions working with the county, we've actually heard that Boulder County is currently looking at from Cherryvale to Manhattan along South Boulder, mm -hmm. kind of study that whole corridor along South Boulder Road. Um, and potentially even looking at is there future pedestrian or porosity that could, you know, pedestrian crossings and to get people to and through that roadway in a different way than that underpass. So as you mentioned, the bikes and the volume of bikes and people and runners, um, that's what we're trying to study and understand what is that use and are there alternate ways to support that? So, I mean, that has become a pinch point. I exactly. mean, you know, I don't know that it was anticipated to be that when it was initially constructed, but it Absolutely. certainly has been. Right, has and it's not a pedestrian underpass. It was no. really for, I believe, cattle originally, right. and it's it's awkward, you know, it's, it's long and dark. And... Right, right. So. so one piece that we're looking at is encouraging the use of the existing paths and bike lanes. So right now there's an uncontrolled crossing at 55th that 55th corridor is identified in the city's low stress bike and net, bike and walk network as the primary crossing, not the South Boulder Creek Trail. Um, so, so there's an idea of providing a controlled crossing at that 55th connection in conjunction with the county and really being able to support bike. Moving some of the bike traffic to 55th, it's a really comfortable biking corridor. And if we can work on this edge of the East Boulder Community Center ponds and have them feel more like part of the South Boulder Creek Corridor, because it really is part of the South Boulder Creek Corridor, um, we can do a lot to make that, that existing multi-use path feel like it is the west side path for South Boulder Creek, right? It, it is the next block over. And so this is just a quick sketch of increasing the biodiversity along that that edge and make it feel more like the same creek wetland complex that's out there that is all a unified whole and it feels like you're you're in part of a one bigger place and our um, our outreach staff is really excited about the opportunities that are associated with that because then you have all the resources of the community center as well that that really are integrated into this one hole again there's more work to do on this piece we're working closely with some folks we know over Parks and Rec to <laughs> look at this. Yeah, it's about time. Yeah. <laughs> but to, as Eileen mentioned, to look at this whole comprehensive where you could kind of use the space, you know, and move from formal park amenities to more natural open space and provide that connectivity. Um, back to the ISP preferred alternative. Um, the, it said, through future area planning, explore potential for new connection to 55th Street. We think this is a really important piece of providing this pedestrian only route for the community at this time. And so between the neighborhood connector to the bridge and this 55th connection, you end up with something like a quarter mile of pedestrian only trail on that west side that really would serve some of the, the needs of the community to have a, a separated area for walking. Um, again, this might help with uh, organizing how uh, access is for maintenance, although we might have a new access route through yeah. kind of place, so we might not need this, but um, uh, it can be part of that, that, all that planning. And this also will work with um, the ditch in terms of coordinating crossing of the ditch and getting across there. We've identified an area along the South Boulder Creek Trail where you can step off the trail and get out of the fray and have a pausing point, really play with that um, changing of time and how you use time. So a place to step off the trail, sit and get those Western views, um, some boulders and benches and just a place to, to come off, off the trail. And that ends up with another 100 feet or so of pedestrian only separated trail 
to create a step off point so that you're not in the fray of it the whole time. And this would be located in an area that's dominated by smooth brome right now. And so we might be able to, to work on the increasing the roughness and the richness there. And it's also part of the wetland system that's supported by the, the flood irrigation of the ditches. So there may be some issues related to that as, as we um, do our mapping, we'll be learning more about this site. Roughness and richness, could you? What does that mean in the <laughs> um, and biodiversity? Okay, rough. The roughness came because when I worked at the airport, you couldn't say anything about habitat because <laughs> that would mean birds, and that's bad. I'm sorry, it's not roughness, it's diversity, please. <laughs> but, but so when you were talking about the airport, the roughness uh -huh. was a euphemism for birds for diversity and okay. for habitat. Roughness was a euphemism for habitat. <laughs> That stuck. We thought we were all wrong. <laughs> yes. Richness, roughness, and richness. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Does, Thank does that include it? Uh, I, I actually think that was probably just the tip of a big iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> and that space, the gapping area, as you can see, it's basically halfway between the bridge, the proposed bridge, and then like where they connect in with the existing path to the north. So that would, again, in the spirit of separated, calmer, that's kind of what we're trying to indicate is really we're seeing different options and alternatives that we can still satisfy a lot of the management guidance. So I think that just, just looks like a really elegant yeah. solution. And I, I want to go there. Good. It's richness. Yeah. Experience. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a rough place. <laughs> rough is a good thing. What else would you want? And then um, there are two designated creek access locations. And so we'll look at bank stabilization to support both um, limiting erosion at those edges and supporting people visiting those edges and being able to make contact with the water. Um, as part of the New Zealand mud snail management, the bridge will become the southmost point of, um, of where there's creek access available. So that's, that's the final line. And north of that, downstream of that, you can touch the water, um, assuming that you're using best management practices. And we'll include like the boot brush stations as part of these areas so that people get some guidance around stewardship as well. Um, but again, there's two additional locations where you can step off the trail and pause and be on the site and just enjoy the place. Um, so one of the management guidance components was to commit to construct and open the bridge and separated paths on the east side before restoration work begins, before additional fencing is installed, and before closing restoration areas to public access. As we've described, we are still working on figuring out how to get a separated east side path in here, what that could be. And so we are looking at a sequencing plan where we get where we can construct the pieces that we are ready to move forward with and then um, close off the area south of the bridge. And then as we move forward and figure out, collect this additional data and develop a plan for the separated trail to then be able to close that north side area. It, it really is these two blocks and um, the south side is much smaller than the north side and is not as it's not getting all of what we want, but it's about the same amount of trail that we'll be able to close and restore. And that south area is really important because of the mud snails to really keep folks out of it. So um, that'll be the first step. And then the second step as we move forward will be to close that north area as well. That's my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very informative. Thanks. So, are there other questions? Well, thanks. I, I, this is really having been involved in this actually since the 1990s. This is really exciting um, to see that you know things are actually uh, coming to fruition. Uh -huh. and, uh, I think it'll be a vast improvement to a really important area um you know in the west side despite the you know the impacts there have some pretty 
neat wetlands and uh, you know associated uh, wildlife uh, with them, and so that's an important component as well. So, thanks, and I'm we'll really look impressed. forward to it. I'm really impressed. Yeah, no, it, uh, it'll be really nice. And, um, the, the new the people at Peacock Place will certainly enjoy it. <laughs> Sanitary. <laughs> yeah. so yeah. Should yeah. they be able to get there? Yeah. <laughs> We'll get flooded out, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we'll keep the board updated as we learn more and move it, you know, and as well as the neighbors. So we appreciate the conversation tonight. Great. Thanks again. And Dan, I don't know, do you have any final and closing comments? Or? For 20 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take yeah. Your time. Well, I actually already did provide you yes, with my, my few verbal updates when we were trying to get Bethany back online. So I think I'm good. And just uh, I don't know if there's any questions about next week's field trip. But um, uh, other than that, um, I think we'll probably send out another reminder email and uh, uh, about the field trip itself. But and uh, transportation. Uh, will be provided here. E-bikes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be great. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll uh, we'll obviously meet here and then uh, carpool out. Right, yeah, okay. Great, anything else for the good of the order? Or? I was just gonna say, I liked how, right, I still like this spot as a meeting place. Um, if we get kicked out and moved to the council chambers, I'll be disappointed because I like how we get to sit around the table. And this last presentation was a good example of we could actually have a dialogue about it. And it's not wait till the end because as soon as you're going through it, we can actually talk about it. So I'm, I'm still lobbying to keep the space if we can. I don't know what the plan is, but. I think what I probably would envision, so council chamber technology is being upgraded as we speak uh, in terms of being able to support board and commission hybrid meetings um, as in, uh, as another place to be able to do that. And uh, probably by midsummer, all the installation and stuff will be completed. Staff is actually starting to be trained this month on how to use the technology that's already been moved in there. And there's some additional technology installation that needs to happen. We are anticipating by mid to late summer that council chambers could be another alternative for boards and commissions. But having said that, I would envision that we have a mix of different meetings. We have retreats, we have study sessions. Um, it's not to say that in any given meeting there, there could be a, uh, a conflict with, with a particular site or the board could lend itself on a particular meeting that they wanna be back here. But so I would say that the hub is always, would always be available for the sort of mix of different meetings. I'll leave it up to the board of where they wanna be. I would say though that if we, especially when we are bringing back public testimony in person, that just the unpredictability of, of that, especially, you know, we had, I think, 24 at the e-bike, like, I don't know, like, how this room would accommodate that or what we would be able to do. And it's only this room that we can do it in. We don't have this technology available in, in the other bigger rooms. So I would say out of necessity, the Chambers is going to have a role for us. Um, but, yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, we can theoretically be somewhat creative in the chambers as well. I mean, there's nothing that would preclude us from, you know, setting up an arrangement like this, you know, kind of in the space that, you know, in front of the da dais that, you know, the council uses or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I, I think we have a number of options. But if, yeah, if we have, uh, I think, uh, items of great public interest, we're going to have to uh, probably meet there just to accommodate uh, the attendance. So we could provide either through an email or next month just an update on where the technology stands. I believe, like I said, staff's already been trained on some of the stuff that's there. So we'll keep you up to date on that. Do you find, I think Michelle's point is partially that the quality and intimacy of the meeting is better in this space. Do you all find that to be the case compared to the, the council chambers or do you find that you can have that experience there as well? Well, I think my personal is, is when we know how many people we're gonna have in the room, like we already kind of said certain staff, like, hey, uh, it's okay if you be remote knowing that we're only be able to get so many people in this room. Under a confined situation where the parameters are known, I personally like the sentiment setting. 
It's just that in any given day, you, you know, how many staff need to support that meeting if, if, if the public is now going to be part of being in person you just don't know, and they get before COVID. We we would we could have twenty five people right. easily at our meetings, and it would be routinely around ten or twelve that would always be joining us in person. Uh, Post COVID life is is a bit unpredictable, so it's hard to say. But not knowing that situation, like I don't we I don't know how we would even accommodate eight people, additional people yeah. in this room. Right, right. I think just capacity wise, right now. So with Leah out on on. Um, parental leave and then we haven't refilled our community engagement vacancy yet this is manageable for us all pitching in <laughs> and we're getting trained and we'll be ready when the time comes uh, to shift into council chamber so there there has been an admin advantage uh, right now for this space yeah right and it, like council when they do some of the study sessions right. they'll set yeah. tables and chairs down on the floor so i think we can still facilitate this more intimate and formal dialogue um, still have the benefit of all the space so there's seating arrangements we could do to kind of create that space as well and maybe next month we can discuss it that's if you want to try to create the intimacy in that room and and that's the will of the trustees it'd be helpful for staff to know that then we could be thinking about how we might want to go into that first meeting back uh, on what it might look like to hopefully recreate some right. of that closeness great sounds good as long as we can still end by nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that regard, I'm glad that. Well, that's why it's early.